Hey everybody, welcome back to the program. I'm very excited because I have a very special guest here in the vinyl pad, Jose James. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be here, brother. Yeah, we're gonna talk about your your latest release. It's your 12th record, 1978. So let's let's get into this. Let's get into it. It seems like voice is number one for you. And then what else what else did you like like growing up? Like did you have an instrument? Did you play something? I played uh, a little bit of guitar. I still play a little bit of guitar. Yeah. Um, you know, jazz guitar is really challenging, really hard. And I was like, <laughs> that's an understatement. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. 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 So when I was 14, I was like, well, I'm playing basketball and yeah. listening to Trap Called Quest and like trying to sort of play. I bought a Gibson and yeah. I was like, this is so hard, you know? Yeah. So I stopped playing, you know? And, um, but then I had this voice and it was like, oh, singing came really easily to me. And actually, Bobby McFerrin was in town. So I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Right, yeah. And he was the artistic director of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. So he was just around. I would see him all over the you know, nice. town. Nice, okay. Listen yeah. to his records and go see, you know, whatever shows I could. I saw him, like, duo with Chick Corea. And it was mind-blowing. So I was like, okay. Yeah. This guy is doing yeah crazy stuff with his voice. Like, it really is an instrument. Why don't I just try to do... And what, yeah, what age was that for you? Um, that was like, it's a good question, like 16. Okay. Yeah. I, I, basically, I want to be a writer first. Mm -hmm. Literature was my first love. And then at 14, my voice changed and I started singing in choirs and things like that. Like, not jazz, but, you know, like uh, Vivaldi went to a Catholic oh. high school. So it was like oh, okay. wow. choir music yeah. and four part, you know, bass, tenor, alto, soprano. Okay, yeah. Very, you know, hardcore Western classical yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I liked, you know, but yeah. the jazz was always in my, my ear because all the hip hop was sampling jazz. Mm -hmm. So you had, you know, Tribe Called Quest and just everything, you know, Beastie Boys. Yeah. And yeah. So I was already like familiar with that. And then when I realized they were samples, you know, pre internet, obviously, it was like, oh, you know, looking at the records, like, yeah. Reading the, the the liner notes like courtesy sample courtesy of right. Roy Ayers, I was like, well, who's Roy Ayers? You know, yeah. I had no idea. No one was teaching me any of this stuff. Yeah, what I was going to ask about your family, like any any music. Well, my dad is a very well known musician in Minneapolis, but I didn't grow up with him, so he wasn't like giving me oh right records okay. and lessons and stuff. I would just kind of see him play. Right, they're the same name, which is very inconvenient for both of us <laughs> okay both yeah. named jose james so yeah uh but he's he plays tenor he plays congas he's panamanian he plays like timbales and oh, wow. latin jazz and he's like amazing yeah thankfully he doesn't sing that's yeah. like the one thing he yeah. doesn't do yeah yeah <laughs> um but my mom you know she was like typical kind of hippie love child vibe you know and she yeah. had all those records you would expect you know Peter Paul and Mary, right, right, and Carol you know, King, Carol King, Tapestry, exactly. <laughs> you know Bob Dylan, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash. Crosby, Stills, Nash, Joni yeah. Mitchell, yeah. and she had a, a good funk thing too. You know, no, she was nice. into yeah. Ohio players, and so I would kind of mm, like okay. go through her, yeah, and just look at the covers. And you know, Billie Holiday was in there. That was like, oh, oh. yeah. I remember listening to her when I was like four or five. Like, wow, that's like different, you know. So it was, it was all kind of there, you know. But honestly, um, the space to kind of discover it on my own, I think, is why I love music, because it was like my choice. Like, nobody was like, do it, you know. Parents are always like, what should I do? If I right. want to get my kid in music, I'm just leave them alone. Right, right. Like, just let them be, let them figure it out, because they're going to find some stuff that um, you don't know about. Uh -huh. You know, you're going to say, oh, you got to hear the Eagles or you got to hear Bob Marley or, you know, whatever our favorite <laughs> yeah. thing is. You yeah. Know? And they're going to find some guy on SoundCloud yeah. or YouTube who nobody knows and has like 100 followers who's in like East London somewhere who's making some crazy stuff under aliases. Like, right. They're going to find that, you know, so just let them find it. Exactly. So that's what I did. I found all these weird records and went to elect electric fetus prince's favorite record store in minneapolis and listened to the radio as much as possible yeah yeah did you make uh mixtapes at all for sure yeah oh yeah yeah oh yeah i remember listening to uh kmoj which was like the black station it still is in minneapolis 
that played more like urban. I mean, we, we didn't have urban back then, right? It was just hip hop and R&B. Right. <laughs> and um, I remember they played Saturday, you know, De La Soul. Mm. It was like the first time I heard it. it was like one in the morning. It was like, oh my God, run and press record, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's kind of cool. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a person that's like, it should be any way with music, mm. but it was cool to experience it kind of in real time because you couldn't just like go stream it. Right. You couldn't like Shazam it. You literally had to like press record on your like little, yeah. you know, tape and like get it and then hope that the DJ would say who it was because sometimes they just played stuff, you know. I know. Even today, like I still listen to like public radio and stuff and sometimes it's like, who is this? Who is this? Right. Or like the thing that gets me, there's the station, uh, it's a college station, the Loyola Marymount mm. station and like some some of the DJs will go they'll start with the first thing they played right and then le- and then all the way up to the last and it's like no no go backwards cuz that <laughs> I'm already lost right now. right 40 minutes ago we yeah. started with <laughs> yeah. Yusuf Latif yeah yeah that's and, funny yeah college radio is so funny that way they all have this sort of it's not a radio voice <laughs> right 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 yeah. yeah but there is still an enthusiasm there it's just a little different you know exactly it's it's funny they will play stuff that's under the radar yeah which I appreciate yeah that's that's what i like the most because i just i i mean i i i love i love the songs i love but i i'm just always hungry for something new or i feel like why waste i shouldn't say waste but like i just want to try to hear it all even though you can't <laughs> absolutely you, <laughs> you can know? hear some of it all at least yeah yeah because yeah, i just i don't know it, it i think it it changes you a little bit the the more you the more you hear and i feel it gets harder as you get older i don't mm. know if you've had that in your experience well i think our tastes mature and and get more specialized and we also attach like emotional resonance to certain things mm. you know like when you were saying or asking like what are some of my favorite uh, pieces of vinyl oh yeah it's not it's <laughs> not like and that's a really hard choice obviously yeah because that might change from time to time but you know a lot of the kind of answers were like things that resonated with me like somebody gave me a copy i think my uncle of purple rain when i was like eight which is I don't know how appropriate that is. Now that I'm a dad, you know, I'm like, mm. and I remember like, but you know, whatever, yeah. like, thank you, Uncle Rick, if it was you. And I still have it, you know, um, yeah. I looked at it today and was like, wow, like, and hearing that record at that age in Minneapolis, I was going to ask, it was yeah. mind blowing. I mean, yeah. it was completely mind blowing. Like, obviously, Michael was like, the king, you know, right. everybody was like obsessed with Michael Jackson, myself included. And I got to see Michael. Oh, wow. I saw the bad tour. Wow. Yeah. At the same age. I mean, it was like mind blowing. Dang. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be the best thing I'll ever see in my life. I already know. Yeah. I knew then I was like, yeah, this is the peak of my life right wow. now. Like it was incredible. It really was. Um, think- there's a moment where like smooth criminal. <laughs> Oh, wow. Like at the end, you know, he did, he hit that like pose and it went to the spotlight and he threw his hat and we were in the, um, you know, the, what, I, what's it called now? It's where the twins used to play, but they changed it now. We we're in the stadium, whatever. Yeah. Big and, place. Big place. Yeah. And every single person, including myself, like st- stood up and reached for the hat. <laughs> like no matter where we were, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was just like an instinctive yeah. Yeah. thing. And, and that was so powerful. It was yeah. so interesting. And as a kid, I was like, oh, music really has this like yeah. power that I could just feel because it moved me. I, I reached for the hat. I wasn't anywhere near, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was everybody like reached out yeah. for the hat. It was yeah. like, wow. It could be a sudden gust of wind. You exactly. Know? <laughs> like, you never know. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. Speaking of uh, where you grew up, do you have any Prince stories? Like did, did that ever? Man, I, I don't. I wish yeah. I did. I kick myself now, obviously, that he's he's gone, which yeah. is, is still shocking to me. You know, it's really, it's like, I know. is he really gone? You know, yeah. I watch videos and um, it's it's funny, too, because I was doing a lot of research for my new album, 1978, and his first album came out in 1978. I was like, man, this is like, this is a lot, you know. I made it purple, 
the, the oh yeah, yeah, I'll show yeah, you. yeah I have yeah. it with me um oh beautiful yeah we did it in his honor but yeah, I never got a chance to see him I was like a little too young right and his scene was very different yeah it was not kid friendly you know Michael was like uh, no, yeah. you know what I mean yeah it was like he would have parties at Paisley Park or like eventually he opened a club uh, Glam Slam downtown and Minneapolis is like a funny place like you know Midwesterners will tell you that we don't we don't uh, speak highly of ourselves. Like we're very like, oh okay. You know we don't brag. You know right, that's right. kind of a thing, or whatever. You know I know there's rap out the Midwest and, but whatever. But it's like, <laughs> in the general culture is like, yeah, we know Prince is here, but like, it's not a big deal. Right. He's he's just one of our local boys. You know that's kind of like the vibe mm. there, which is weird. Like I remember going to he had a pop up shop, uptown, and. He didn't announce it. He just like made a pop up, and you walk in. There's like no sign or anything. Wow. And like his like the famous like gun mic was in there for like twenty five thousand dollars, and oh wow, like memorabilia. And you're yeah. just like, what is this? And there's just like this big ass dude, all in black, who just would like point a finger, and you'd go up a stair. I remember we all walked up, you know, yeah. and it was just like this room. It sounds like a dream I'm having, but it was like this room. <laughs> That was like dark with like pillows and you, they were just, somebody was there and just like, no one said anything, just like sit, you know? Yeah. And you sat on this pillow and then they played on a loop, George Clinton's uh, Paint the White House Black video. Okay. And that was the whole thing, you know? And I was like, <laughs> I, I was like 13, you know? I was like, this is so Prince. Yeah. And then the video would end and they would like point to the door and then you'd go out the door and that was, that was it. Wow. And like, I never met anyone else who did that. In Minneapolis, mm -hmm. this is what I mean. Yeah, like if it was in New York or some, you know, like if oh, Jay Z yeah, was doing, yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. would be crazy. Every the line would be crazy, and like Supreme would be making right. a, a merch or whatever. Like in Minneapolis, it was like, yeah, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, and then let's talk about your new album. I, I was able to hear it, um, but having it on repeat, I really like where you went with this Thank like you. kind of the deep dive of your discography and it's just like it, this one really resonates with me i don't know what you did differently um it's a good question well i have a copy with me let me show it to you man it's uh i'm super proud of this i just got this like oh man that, that yes yeah. i need to take this off just to, wow how cold was that water it was <laughs> <laughs> that water was so cold that, that is not ai that is real yeah we, we were recording upstate um near woodstock uh and this is called the the Esopus river and we so jeanette beckman she's a legendary uh music documentary photographer and she does she's worked for def jam she shot like the ll boombox famous picture and slick rick you know all oh, of and yeah, yeah. Peppa, all of the like famous like late 80s hip hop stuff, rap stuff. And she also coming from London shot like, you know, um, Blondie and the Sex Pistols and the Ramones and the police Dang. first stuff. She's like an yeah. absolute legend. Yeah. So we were driving around because that's kind of what we do. Like what, what would be a good shot? And I was obsessed with being in the river in a suit. And she was like, it sounds dangerous, you know, <laughs> but she's so cool. Yeah. She's so yeah. punk. She was like, let's just try it. Yeah. So we found this uh, bend of the river, and it's really deep, actually. This is kind of the like more shallow part where the, all the fly fishermen would hang out. There was like one guy just like in yeah. hip waders there looking at me like, what are you doing? What is this guy doing right now? <laughs> so we show up, you know, and I had like Nikes on. Yeah. We just took a bunch of shots. And this one we loved because the water, as you can see, just like started to kind of like get these big waves. Mm. And the light was beautiful it kind of it, there's a lot of mythology on this album and i'm kind of hinting at that like um i talk about like orpheus you know and this idea of the ability to go between worlds you know sort of at a at your whim you know like he was yeah. he was like i'm gonna go down to the land of darkness to see hades to see if i can get my girl back you're like okay <laughs> you know what i mean and i like this picture because it's kind of like if you look over my shoulder it seems like that's the land of darkness behind me mm. i'm on this i'm on this 
yeah. bridge of water. And I think there's like a spiritual aspect to that. Um, also growing up by the Mississippi River, that was sort of rich with meaning, you know, um, stretching all the way through America and all the yeah. fantastic yeah. stories and our own mythology around that. Um, so that was a part of it, you know, but I think, you know, 78, besides it being my birth year, so this is a very autobiographical album. Um, I'm obsessed with that era, man. Like 1976 to like 79 is just like, wow, mm -hmm. so rich, you know, like yeah. everything and, and every genre, every style. And, and, and in particular, 1978 fascinates me because it's like all these planets are like colliding and everything is like exploding, you know, like discos, like right, right, at its right. peak, just about to turn into hip hop, you know, and rap. And then you had like punk exploding. You had uh, reggae coming to like the world stage all of a sudden with Kaya. You know, you had all these like cool singer songwriters like, you know, Billy Joel, Elton John doing these interesting projects and kind of coming to their peak. Right, and, right. You know, James Taylor. Uh, and then you had all these jazz musicians who had survived like the 50s, 60s and were still around. Yeah. So talented, like Herbie, you know, mm -hmm. or any of those cats. And they were doing their thing and also working with, you know, the rock musicians and pop musicians. So to me, it's like fascinating because like most of the records from that era are basically jazz musicians playing pop and R&B. Mm. It's kind of like weird. Yeah. And the, and the pop and R&B guys, they're influenced by like a love supreme and all these like, you know, right, right. Yeah, so it's like this yeah. weird, like mix of like everything. Um, and it's all recorded to tape, which right. we also did too. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. We went super analog. So there's this beautiful studio. Um, stop me because I know I'm. I'm, I'm no, I love this. I stuff. love this topic. Yeah, yeah. We recorded uh, at Dreamland Recording Studios, with this, which is an old church in the middle of the woods. Okay. Near Woodstock, and I love it because yeah. you can stay there, and it's it's in the middle of the woods. There's no there's nowhere yeah. around. So yeah. Yeah, like you can take a break, go outside, look at the trees, take a walk, come back in, nail the track. I mean, it's like unbelievably chill. Wow. And the band relaxes. Everybody just kind of like yeah. gets into the vibe of making the album. Um, but the gear is in impeccable. It's all vintage. It's all beautiful. And they have two tape machines, super well maintained. So, yeah, we, we tracked everything to two inch tape wow. and it just had that. I mean, I could have released the board mix, to be honest, as the album. That would have mm, been mm. great. I mean, obviously, we spent a lot of time yeah. mixing it also to tape here in L.A. Oh, you did? Okay. I was going to ask, yeah, how you mastered that. So. Yeah, so we mixed it um, mixed it to tape here at uh, Lucy's Meat Market, which is Pete Min's place uh, in Eagle Rock, which is amazing. That's where Michelle and Degacello, Chris Daddy Dave, and, you know, Mark Juliana do all their records. I've been working out of there uh either recording or mixing for like seven years now okay that. i love his stuff i love his ears i love his yeah his vibe um and then we mastered it uh both for vinyl and for digital at abbey road with frank arkwright who's done i think wow. my last four records he's like the king he's like the rock guy but yeah i find yeah. i find rock engineers are like more open-minded to like taking chances you know, Interesting. Yeah. They're kind of like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Like you watch like Butch Vig with Nirvana. He's like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I thought this sounded cool. So I just pushed it, you know? Like I'm always like yeah, begging, yeah. especially like with jazz. I'm always like, I want the hip hop, this, you know, the, the drums to sound more like Jay Dilla. I'm like, yeah, but it's too loud. And I'm like, but that's the point. <laughs> I'm like, just, can you just, <laughs> yeah, just yeah, take your hand, yeah. just push it, just, just. Yeah. But there is like a kind of an openness. Or like almost like I don't care, not in a negative way with rock where there's like let's try it, right? Yeah, let's go, let's let's see what happens because I think that's that's where you find things that are interesting in in the project mm -hmm. and in in the mix, and sometimes you don't like it, but at least you tried it. You know, you never know till you hear it. You know. Yeah. What what other did. Did you look at other records and how they sounded as a blueprint for how you wanted this record to sound in the mix? I did. I got to pull this one out. Okay. <laughs> so Marvin Gaye, I Want You. Yes. Um, 
this is my like favorite album of all time. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can confidently say that. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And I actually met Leon Ware, who wrote and produced this here in in uh, Marina del Rey. God, like over ten years ago at this point. Um, and we wrote together. We had a whole afternoon. Wow. Yeah, it was never released, but we we chopped it up and talked about all of this, you know, Marvin, um, Motown, his career. And he gave me a really key piece of information, which is that Marvin, him, Al Green, all those guys, yeah. Sam Cook, all started as jazz singers, which blew my mind. And he was like, it's just because there was nothing else. Mm. There was no other music. So we all, you had church music and you had jazz. So you right. learned jazz. And Marvin obviously wanted to be a jazz singer. I mean, we know he made some records, in tribute to Nat King Cole. But then they realized, like, well, we could make a lot more money doing this R&B thing. Yeah. So they just switched over. He was like, it was that simple. And when he told me that, it was like, oh, like a huge light switch just turning on. Because when I listen to Marvin Gaye, I hear a jazz singer, mm. but not singing jazz. Right, right, right. Um, which is like... Right, right, a new right, concept yeah, for a lot of people yeah. to kind of get, but you know, then you think about okay, there's George Benson and there's Lou Rawls, and w the more you think about it, it's like that like Kaiser Slow Say moment, you know. It, it, you're right, supposed to be right. like, oh right, like everybody, Bill Withers, you know, he sang jazz too. It's like they all had that training, and they all knew those standards, so they all kind of had this this sort of basic set of songwriting concepts and like harmonic information that you can just hear in all their stuff you know wow yeah so yeah. this album i mean yeah oh god i mean the the performances are ridiculous like the the band james gadson you know chuck rainey bass i mean it like i don't want to name everyone because there's a huge list but like <laughs> the sound of this and the feel of it um really inspired me and you know, I didn't want to like emulate it, but it, a lot of this is very much like an homage to what they created on this album, what yeah. Quincy created on Off the Wall with Michael Jackson and, um, yeah, and yeah. that band. And it's really about celebrating, I guess, you know, three things like the performer, but not in sort of the way we think of it now, like because like Michael and, and Marvin, they have so many voices on those two records. like they have like 20 different vocal tracks going. Mm -hmm. It's not just like one singer singing. It's like an right, right. ensemble of Michaels and Marvins, you know? <laughs> yeah. So you have that, you have like the producer who's coming with this jazz harmony, you know, yeah. Quincy and, and Leon. Uh, and then you have this band that's just like this, like on both records, it's like super tight, funk, but jazz oriented, just killers, you know? And they're just laying down these grooves that are like ridiculous. Um, so I was like, I want that. And I want the drums to sound like Jay Dilla. So that was, yeah, that yeah. was the, my little, like, let me bring it to now too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I definitely heard a lot of that when I was, had that on repeat. Oh, yeah. Thanks, yeah. I've been really, really digging it. And that lead single. Yeah. That's fantastic too. Thank you. It's just, um, something about that particular sound is like is resonating with with me right now because i'm i'm hungry for that mm. that particular i, I don't want to call it like soul funk but it's just i don't know what soul funk is good <laughs> yeah. yeah i like that I like but that. like that's yeah. that's just like been my thing like um I, a couple of or gosh when was that was that 22 i guess the dip i don't know if you know the dip um neo soul band no uh they had this song that like really hit home for me it's like mm. when you lose someone mm. um and yeah so i've just like ever since then i've been just sort of on this just hungry for that like a, like a hippo just <laughs> eating that up and so when this came i was like yes yes give me more yeah, thank you so i gotta check out the dip that's cool yeah i have it over here i can show it to you mm. but uh you know yeah they're they're um they're from the pacific northwest like mm. in s some respects like i think they're they're better than i think they have the right to be i don't know like they just you know what i mean it's just <laughs> don't like... sleep on don't sleep on that area though i mean <laughs> yeah. that's you know Jimi hendrix right oh you're Ray right Charles, yeah. yeah quincy jones yeah they're all from seattle man it's like whoa like yeah interesting and of course you know 
I love Nirvana. Nirvana. Right, Nirvana. right, 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 right. Nirvana's my favorite band of all time, which Interesting. Really, really freaks people out. But I'm like, dude, yeah. they were the biggest rock band in the world when I was a kid. Like, of course I love Nirvana. Like, what? Yeah. And I lived in Seattle for a while, but I was too young then. I okay. never saw them play, which is just kills me. Right. I'm like, I was there, but I was like in like fifth grade. You know what I mean? Man. Yeah. yeah. I was like skating and stuff. Yeah. Uh, did you, what, do you have a favorite record of theirs? <sighs> it's okay. That's a divisive, that's I know, a divisive I question. I know, I know, I know. I kind of, I, to, here's an interesting take on this. I find when the discography is like kind of limited. Yeah. Like D'Angelo, I feel the same way. I don't really think about it as like albums. Gotcha. Even Michael Jackson, I'm like, it's a body of work that mm, I like. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm talking about like Marvin, you know, who put out like right, yeah, just dozens yeah. and dozens, or like you know the, those kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Then or or even like Bill Withers, you know, he's got mm-hmm. like ten records. It's like okay, still Bill, boom. Okay. That's it, you know, for me. Yeah. But for Nirvana, it was just kind of like watching like a like a rocket take off you know you're like yeah. it started here it got here and it exploded that's how i think of them as a band and what they accomplished mm-hmm. um and there are certain moments that like on bleach or in utero or whatever that i just like love mm-hmm. i would never say like this is the album you know it's like well, yeah yeah the whole thing is cool and 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 to watch a a band like unfold in real time that is like beautiful man you know that's why i love jazz because you can it's all documented and it's with nirvana it's documented too it's like yeah changing drummers changing vibes changing songwriting you know all of a sudden kirk cobain's yeah. writing like grandma take me home and then he's writing like heart-shaped box and you're like what yeah. happened to you bro like, <laughs> yeah like yeah how did you you know and i love those moments where and hopefully you know somebody out there is feeling like that about this record uh for me where it's like you have a personal jump, you know, and I think when you have that kind of like spiritual or emotional transformation, hopefully it is reflected in the, the songwriting and the production. You know, I produced that too. Um, I forgot to mention that, which is it's the first thing I've produced by myself since The Dreamer, my first album oh, back wow. in 2008. Yeah, I've had co-producers on pretty much everything. Um, which has been cool too. You know, I've yeah. learned a lot from people. What number is this for you? I think it's twelve. Twelve. Okay. I think it's twelve. Yeah, I have to go back and count. Yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a journey. <laughs> I was noticing uh, one of your. I think it's the album right before this one, the Alice Coltrane homage yeah. on the cover. I really, I really, I really dug that one too. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. I love how. Um, I think I got that one. You're not. Me. Yeah, I think is it. On, the, on and on, yeah. On the bottom, to Erica no? Badu. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a gorgeous one. cover. Yeah, I love that. Thanks, man. Another Jeanette Beckman photo. And yeah, I wanted people to know, like you know, people like yourself got it right away. Oh, this is an homage to Alice Coltrane. Yeah. It's like, oh, what? Interesting. Because <laughs> I, I try to. Yeah. I love visual art too. Like I'm always trying to go to museums on the road or like look at photography or mm-hmm. sculpture painting because that really feeds me um and I, I i try to give people yeah something to something different mm-hmm. something to make them think like well this is a tribute to erica Badu. why is he making a exact near replica right right journey in Sacha Dananda? you know it's like what <laughs> and then when they hear it it's like oh yeah i get it now you know um but my whole journey and the quest I think as an artist has been to like connect the dots and say like these boxes, these genres, they don't exist really. Right, right, you know? right. Yeah. For for us they don't, you know. Right. For artists they don't. They don't exist. Um it's the same for actors. You know, it's like we, we on the outside it's like, well, this is Broadway and this is film and this is TV and this is uh, mm-hmm. if you, if you guys it's just it's all words and, and emotion, you know. I don't know. I don't want to speak for you, but it's like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the same thing in different formats. You well, know? that's one. That's definitely a thing I notice with your body of work is just you. You're not beholden to any one thing, and you you do feel free to explore. I I was recently like going back through some of my old records, and I was struck by like 
I feel like we lost a little bit of this. <clears throat> I can't think of the what album I was specifically listening to at the moment, but even like if you look, listen to some er, early like psychedelia, mm. like there'll be some trippy out there songs and then they'll do like English blues, right. like the next track. Like yeah. there wasn't like, or, you know, it was the Doobie Brothers. It was mm. one of the Doobie Brother albums. Like they have uh, this song called Ukiah. And they're talking about like Northern California and then they, they go into all these different places musically. And I, I feel like we're at this, at least in terms of like the way albums are made today, it's almost like artists are feeling like, well, I can't, I, I have, it all has to like, be cohesive mm. it can't you know you don't always have to tell a concept with your right. <laughs> with your album i mean yeah it doesn't always need to be just like a collection of singles but like you know i think i think you should have freedom i think you should feel free to like explore but i i just feel like with algorithms now mm. and just the way spotify it's sort of been a disservice and really it seems like singles have come back in a big way big time you know yeah, yeah so, i mean i feel like I, I agree with all that. I, I don't I don't think it's necessarily like good or bad. It's just kinda like is what it is. Yeah. Um definitely. It's something I've noticed. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean what is kind of cool is like singles now I think people are putting way more into those, which is kind of interesting. Where it's yeah. like it's not so much like a throwaway moment. Yeah. It's yeah, like, oh, yeah. a single might be might be all you got. So make that single really fascinating. And I think um that's kind of cool. I mean, for me, I'm very, very lucky and grateful to own my own label. So, you know, there's no, I mean, to be real, I can't tell you the relief that I felt when I switched labels as a, as a human being. It was like, oh, I didn't realize I was like carrying this like burden of like, I might get dropped, you know, oh, there's this, yeah, Ugh. it's a conditional <laughs> thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I have, like, nothing but love for all the labels I've worked with. Like, yeah. I'm very proud of everything I've done. But when there is that, like, financial pressure on everything you do, I think it's um, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's going to, like, turn into a diamond under that pressure. You know, uh, Beyonce, yes. Many people, no. You right, know? right. Um, and I'm not saying this is good or bad. It just is what it is, you know. So, like, now I just make what I want to make, you know. And, like, if I want to make a totally non-commercial album, then I can. And then I have to, you know, also, like, take that responsibility for right. that choice. But yeah, I yeah. could do it, you know, if I wanted to. Um, I haven't so far. <laughs> 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 but, you know, it, it, yeah. I am making... I am making albums like LPs too. That's changed where it's like, I feel like in the seventies, an album was an LP mm -hmm. in the fifties, sixties. And that's just what it was, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't want to diss a track, but you know, it's like, this is, this has been known as what an album is for a long time in American yeah. history of music. Yeah. 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 And I'm definitely in that headspace now where it's like, when I'm thinking of the artwork, I'm thinking of it in this size. I'm thinking of it being seen and felt and like what's, you know, all the things that we love, the vinyl nerdery, mm -hmm. what's it going to be, you know, like yeah. how, how's it going to look like, you know. The yeah, color of the record. The color of the record, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. we do, um, at Rainbow Long, we do like a limited run of, of color. The first press is mm -hmm. one color, which is cool, yeah. Can we talk about your uh, the record label? It's like you co-founded it. Yeah. So yeah, tell me a little bit of the history of that and like how that came about and maybe would you do it again? Oh yeah, great questions. Yeah. Well, um, Tali, aka Tali Billy, who is my partner, she is the president of the label and it's really, it's really her baby, you know. Okay. I was on um, Blue Note at the time. We just, we just celebrated five years of Rainbow Blonde Records. So um, we're now in our sixth year, which is, wow, I can't believe that. Yeah, that's that happened that fast. Going to kindergarten. Now. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I was on Brownswood Recordings. I think. Well, this is our repress. But my first album, The Dreamer, came out in 2008 on Brownswood Recordings, and this is the 2018 10th anniversary version. And you know, I got the rights back to that record, and then Black Magic, produced by more electronic people, Flying Lotus, Moody Man. 
Taylor McFerrin, uh, DJ Me Too, The Beats, people like that. That was right behind it. Um, so we knew I was going to get these records back. And Tali was like, you should start a label. Yeah. You know, let's, let's start a label. And a good friend of mine, Richard Spaven, who's a producer and drummer in London, was also telling me for years, you should start a label. And I was like, you know, I was on Blue Note. I was yeah, yeah. turning around the world. I was thinking about the next album. I was doing Fifty Shades Darker soundtrack. You know, I was like, no, label, it sounds hard. It sounds like hard yeah, work. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't, I didn't have the vision. And thankfully, Talia did. Um, she was like, let's do this label. And at least we'll have a place to put out the dreamer, you know, yeah. which made sense. Yeah. So that was our first release. Um, and I made the, the big mistake of oh, no. remixing and remastering it, which like the director's cut, you know, the artist's yeah, cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody cares about that stuff. I spent like, I don't know, you know, $20,000 or something doing the whole thing and had it, you know, recut here in LA and mixed in there. And everybody was like, we just want the old one, man. You know? Yeah. We, we, I should have just put it out on vinyl and went crazy with the old one, but whatever. You learn these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it gave me some some compassion for for george lucas for redoing all this star wars i was like okay i get it and then nobody likes i get it you're like okay yeah i get yeah. it um but we did that and then black magic and then tolly's an incredible singer songwriter uh, in her own right who has done she's written a lot of my most like popular stuff and she's written for a lot of different people becca stevens oh, she's like cool. grammy nominated so she had a collection of songs she wanted to release and she was like, I think I want to put this on our label. Cool. And it was like, oh, all of a sudden we're like a real label. Yeah. Know? So we put out her uh, first two albums. And then Ben Williams, who's a Grammy winning bassist and composer, um, he won with Pat Metheny, the jazz guitarist. Yeah, yeah. He was on uh, Concord and he heard about Rambo Blonde and said, hey, I got a new idea. And he started playing me these demos where he was singing this beautiful R&B stuff. And I fell in love with it and said, yeah, man, let's let's do it. So we we did his first album as a singer. Uh, he plays bass on it too, but uh, called I Am A Man. And that was the moment, I think, for me and Tali where it was like, oh, like, it's not just about us. Like, yeah. someone literally left their label to come to work with us. And that was like, oh, okay. That's cool. Let's, uh, yeah. Yeah. let's take this to another level. So, you know, we always had global distribu distribution through back then Ingrus, now now Virgin. Um, so that was always cool. And we worked with yeah. Universal in Japan. Um, and it's honestly, it's a, it's a space where we really care about the whole thing. You know, Talia's whole vision is it's called an inside out label, where it's not just like the talent that's like put forward. You know, on our website, we have our business management, we have mm. graphic designer, we have our photographer, we have like our vibe director, Brett Sanders, who okay. does exactly what you think. Like wow, he keeps the wow. vibe strong and connects people yeah. globally. We have literally every single person that we work with uh, and they have their own spot on the website. That's because, awesome. Because um, that's, that's the whole thing, you know, the graphic design. I mean, you know this, it's like, that's what music is. It's not just the song. Yeah. Um, but it is, it does feel a little bit like early Motown meets early Blue Note mm. because we use the same photographer, the same graphic designer. You know, they had Francis Wolf and Reed Miles. Uh, we have Hayden Miller and Jeanette Beckman. Um, so they do the majority, uh, pretty much every single thing except Tali took uh, her own photo of, of her last record, which okay. is cool. <laughs> um, and, you know, we work with a lot of similar people. Uh, to get that sound cohesive and yeah yeah and we're also songwriters you know we're also producers so like this the latest uh, record which will be out in may is the debut of jaris yokely who is like oh my god if you if if tony williams and jay dilla and elvin jones wow were like one thing yeah and a drummer yeah. it's jaris he's yeah. mind-blowingly good um uh, He's in my band for as long as I can keep him. <laughs> he's like Questlove's favorite drummer, Tony Roster Jr. Who's, who's, wow. That's his favorite drummer. He's like, yeah. your favorite drummer's favorite drummer. Uh, he also sings and produces, and his record's called Sometimes Late at Night. 
I co-produced it. Uh, we worked for two years with him from demo Dang. to getting in the studio. And I guess, you know, to, to pat ourselves a little bit on the back. Yeah. You're not going to find that at another label. Like, mm -hmm. I know I've, I've, I've had indie deals. I've had major deals. Nobody has the time or bandwidth to, to, to give you two years. Mm -hmm. uh, of yeah. Counseling and, and, you know, workshopping and trying stuff. I, we did the same with Ben. Um, ben Williams, when he brought the album to us and what ended up on Wax, totally different. But we gave him that time because we're, we're both artists. So we, we know it's like sometimes you have it already and you're like, this is it. Sometimes you need time. Yeah. Just let it happen. So we're like, yeah, take your time. Like, there's no rush. We'll help you. Yeah. And, um, and that album is going to blow your mind, by the way. Jerry Oakley. It's like, man, yeah, I'm looking forward. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> it literally sounds like nothing I've ever heard before. Crazy. Yeah. That's saying something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I, I, um, since since starting this channel and like getting to know like not only like the, the album itself but like meeting some of the people in the industry and stuff I, I i do notice like like you mentioned motown blue note like mm -hmm. back in the day like that was almost like a like a symbol of quality right you you could just buy blind absolutely and i i feel like you know no disrespect but like sometimes you know as labels get bought up mm -hmm. like that kind of goes away a little bit whoever founded it you know they're no longer involved so i like to see this resurgence of these independent mm -hmm. labels like there's another label totally different genre but it's it's also like artist run like he this guy george clanton he started mm -hmm. it and like recruits other people and like gets people who are normally just behind a computer making music to be out in front of mm -hmm. an audience maybe doing some live things, mm. but like, you know, it's such a new experience for them who are, you're just used to making computer stuff. So right. uh, I really like that. I really like that, that idea of, and then the fact that you, you do reuse a lot of the same uh, artists and photographers mm. to create this like, kind of like, you almost, it almost becomes like a collectible thing in a way, not, not to discredit the music, no, but it's like, I was yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I know this. Oh, I've seen this. Like yeah. you're in a, you know, so yeah, I, I really commend that. That's really neat. I Thank like you. that. Yeah. Yeah, we actually started, it's kind of funny. We were like, no text on the on the albums. Just <laughs> Jeanette's Jeanette's yeah. covers, which we really tried to do. Actually, I yeah, I brought this too. We we first tried to do that with Blue Note. This is a, the first uh shot we did with Jeanette. Mm -hmm. And we were like, we want the logo off. And we mm -hmm. fought them so hard, but they're like, no, we have to have just the logo. But there's no text, there's no yeah. name. And she like was like, I love that. And so obviously we kept working with her. Um, and only on this one, because I was like, we have to get the text exactly like yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah. Cold Train. But and obviously this is a departure because Hayden was like, Well, now that we're doing text, can I do a 1978 yeah. like graphic? And we saw it, we're like, yo, it's so fresh. But you know, we we don't take ourselves too seriously, but I think we are creating like a yeah, like a body of work. I mean, I hope mm -hmm. people will look back and be like, wow, like these guys did some cool stuff, man. And I got to, if you pull out the the vinyl, it's perfect. Oh, yeah, I'll let you, yeah. Man, it's. Show and tell. <laughs> dude. Yeah, we all kind of get to claim a color. Oh. And I was like, it's got to be purple. Yeah. Because Prince and, you know. Yeah. His first album, God rest him, man, you know. But yeah, we. um when I was recording it, Tali was like, you know, this is going to be a double LP, right? And I was like, no, we'll do the 70s board fade. Don't worry. And she was like, mm. <laughs> and then we started listening to the tracks and like, because, you know, like they're long. Yeah. Like yeah. The side A is two songs, you know? Yeah. Uh, side B is three songs. Every, every, every other side is two songs. Mm. And, and it's like, well, that's kind of 70s too. I mean, I, I just know? got lost in it, you know, Appreciate it's just, it. yeah, it's. The vibe is strong. Yeah, That's and this was this was a fun record you put out as well. I enjoyed this. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. My, my Christmas album. I wanted it to feel like a classic. You know, like a mm -hmm. '50s classic. This is the first time I did um, LCR, like left, center, right. So it's like very. Oh. If you go, yeah, like if you go, yeah. <laughs> It's 1950s, so like so cool, kind of blue or yeah, like yeah, Time yeah. Out or um, Love Supreme, you know, that bit yeah. later, but that kind of style of mm -hmm. like hard left, yeah. hard right. So like yeah. piano was like super hard right, 
drums are, you know, you mm-hmm. can really feel it. And I was like, we're gonna, we're gonna do that. And that's how I really got into tape too, because Ariel Shafir, who's the engineer at Dreamland said, we doing tape on this? And I was like, nah, like I had a bad experience once mm. with tape. Um, not, cause not everybody has good tape and you know, it can stretch, Yeah, which happened to me. Mm. And they're like, well, that's, that's the session. Sorry. And you're like, oh. Cause it, I didn't back it up to Pro Tools. Oh. It was just literally to tape. Cause I was like, it's gotta be just to tape, you know? Yeah, yeah. Stupid. Uh, back everything up to Pro yeah. Tools as you record and tape, <laughs> just in case. Yeah. But Ariel's like, dude, no, like we, our tape is great. And like the machines serviced every week, you know? I was like, all right. And then man, I did it and it was like, oh, no, nah, I just love tape. Mm-hmm. I'm just obsessed mm-hmm. with tape, you know? Do you, do you feel that you, you play differently because tape is rolling and tape is not uh, cheap? Good question. I mean, yes. Well, I'm, it, it's a tough question because I never rehearse, first of all. Oh, okay. I've never rehearsed, ever. Um, and I, I'm very much in the Miles Davis school of like, get the best musicians you can find who are compatible, yeah. the best material, and make it simple. Make it, don't, don't bring anything like too complex that you have to read it. Just like a couple chords and let's create something that challenges you. And that's what I that's what I do with the Badu thing. There was no rehearsal. There was no wow. charts. There was no nothing. We just showed up and they're like, "What are we playing?" They're like, "This is what we're playing." And I'm like, okay, boom. I mean, obviously they knew her stuff, but it was yeah, very like yeah. first take. So I try to get that jazz feeling on mm-hmm. everything. Um, yeah, like my favorite things. Marcus Strickland came in like an hour before the session, and we just started playing. And that literally, that's just like the first take. It was like, everyone's just like, oh, boom. We just did it. And I like to capture that spirit. But with tape, you do know that there is no like do over. So it kind of adds another mm-hmm. level of it. So I was already kind of there. But you know, when it's digital, you're like, well, I can punch in. That's the key thing. It's right, like, right. Um, hey, man, I didn't, Mr. Sandra, I was like, I didn't like that. There's one note on the bridge. I didn't like, can I go punch it? And yeah, you're like, yeah. Go punch it and boom but tape there's no punching mm. that's it and it, is it um <clears throat> any overdubs or anything like that like you go back and yeah so okay. it's actually a f- kind of funny story um i was in new york during that recent like horrible weather <laughs> debacle that you may have heard of where they like canceled like a thousand flights in a day oh, okay yeah, i was yeah. one of the flights oh man so we recorded the album everything was like done we had the hard drive, um, so we bounced everything down to tape to Pro Tools, had it in the hard drive, and for some reason we checked it in the luggage. I don't know why. Mm. It was one of those we were tired, you know. Yeah. But we're like we're flying back to LA, and I had four days booked to do my vocals. I had scratch vocals done with the band, and I was going to do a vocal session for four days here in Eagle Rock um, with Pete Min. Then our flight got delayed. We were at the airport. For like 12 hours Ugh. and long story short our flight never left but our luggage did oh no yeah with the hard drive in it Ugh. so we couldn't get back to la and we didn't have the hard drive we didn't have the session of the album and i had to get the album done because i was going on tour so it was kind of a nightmare so i basically we went back to woodstock i begged ariel like do you have an extra day at you know and they re- really don't because they're booked out like a year in advance, you know, wow. um, Regina Spector and the Flea Fox is more of like a rock kind of mm-hmm. focus with a lot of what they record. Yeah, yeah. But the sound is, again, it's that rock open mindedness, you know. So they had one day open. And so I had I ended up, and obviously they had all this files still because we had just recorded the session. Oh. So I had okay. to do it there. And they only had one day available. Oh, wow. And it was the 4th of July. And I, so I did all the vocals for 1978 in one day. Dang. Every single one, except for, for Trayvon, which I had recorded live with the string quartet. Okay. So I, ha- I did every vocal, including all the backing vocals, in one day, which is like, it was an 18-hour wow. session. And I don't, singers don't try this at home. I, don't, I would never want to do it again. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy with the results, but 
it was nuts. And to make matters worse, it was the 4th of July and we we're upstate in the middle of right. the woods. Right. So like seven o'clock, bam, bam, bam. And Ariel's like, hey, did, are you hearing that? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, what is that? And he's like, oh man. So we, he moved me to another room, isolated. We're in the, in the take and he's like, man, I'm so sorry. I can still hear it. We, we kept moving around till we uh, found this like one like super isolated room. And it was crazy. It was just like, it was like World War Three <sighs> for like hours. And yeah, I'm like, okay. Yeah. But I feel like in those moments, and it wasn't funny at the time, trust me, but like yeah. in those moments, you just kind of got to be like, well, whatever, man. This is, you know. Yeah. Like, A Love Supreme was recorded in three hours. You know, I I Want You was recorded, or not not I Want You, um, Marvin Gaye's most famous album. Um, What's Going On? What's Going On was recorded in 10 days. Right, right, right. So you're yeah. like, okay, like, this is my, my hurdle to jump, mm -hmm. you know. I got to do all the vocals in a day and the fireworks are going off. <laughs> Let's go. You know, and I got yeah. it done. I got yeah. it done. And I yeah. remember there was one, like, Ariel was, like, exhausted. But I was, like, in this weird space you get into as a performer where you're, like, you know you're going to collapse after, but you're, like, full of ideas. Yeah. And there was this, like, one little vocal part that I just heard. We were, like, mixing it down. We were done. I was like, Ariel, man, I got this one, one last <laughs> There was like literally one mic set up and he was like, it was like two in the morning. Oh, wow. We started yeah. at like 9 a.m. It was really like, yeah, yeah. like, can I just get one more? And he was like, fine. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even like open his eyes. He was just like, he didn't even move. He was just like, fine. And I went in and Tali, it was just the three of us. She was like, he, he kind of gave her a look like, man, <laughs> yeah, I really love you guys. You know, and then I, I, and I did the part and he was like, oh, that sounds amazing. Oh, <laughs> he's like, all right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's he's um, he's a hero. He's a hero. He he made it happen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I I mean, not that I want that to happen to everybody, but I do find like those moments of like, you know, those things that for they they kind of force you to like rise to the occasion. Like sometimes, like really amazing things will happen that you didn't plan for mm. or. You know, it's just it's it's sort of like that whole that old thing in college, like your your computer crashes and you have to rewrite your paper, but it's actually comes out better. Right. You know. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So it's just that's beautiful that we well, can't yeah. overthink it. I mean that's mm, that's yeah. how I sound. Yeah. That's how I sound. That's that's my voice. You know, the, the kind of secret of all this is like even in classical, like they'll like do a passage over and over again, you know. That blew my mind. I thought like Classical musicians were like oh. the pure ones who were like yeah. But it was like no, like they'll they'll do a passage, even solo piano. It's like and cut in, you know, because mm -hmm. it has to be perfect, you know. And in pop, obviously, you know, you could do a, you know, vocal for months, one vocal, and just get right. it perfect, perfect. And you know, I think we actually got closer to the spirit of the '70s in that way, where it's like yeah, I don't yeah. know. This is the time we got, man. Throw the tape on the reel and like do it, you know. Maybe Marvin maybe missed my point. <laughs> maybe Marvin called down the <laughs> Marvin was like, he will yeah. not leave New York. Yeah, there's that, yeah, there's that energy, that agency you get, you know, when you don't have you don't have that luxury. Right. Um, yeah, I mean both are good, you know. Totally. Taking not your time. Either. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there is something you know, just, you got it done versus like, you know, you, it's, it's almost like you can't agonize over the small things. You can't sweat the small things in exactly. those moments. So, yeah. Wow. What a great story. What what else uh, did you, you bring? I noticed oh, a, a Beck. There's a Beck record yeah, in morning there. Morning phase. <laughs> yeah. Morning phase. I mean, man, like, I love Beck. Like, if there's anybody that I would like most love to collaborate with mm -hmm. is Beck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Beck, if you're watching, let's go. I'm ready. I, Pasadena. I, I'd be thrilled if he was watching. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you never know, man. Beck is, he's one of those guys who's, yeah. he's just done it so long. You yeah. Know? And he's, he really, him and like Michelle Negacello, I feel like they really go where their spirit takes them. Mm. And I love Beck in particular because like he'll have a huge album like this was, and then he'll just follow it up with like, just like whatever he wants. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and yeah, I love that because yeah. it's not, 
look, I'm Gen X, you know, I'm the youngest Gen X, right? So it, I feel like that's kind of our vibe. Where it's like, we know fame kills. We know fame mm. is fickle. Yeah. We know that it's more interesting to have a long career doing a bunch of things. And yeah, if there's some albums that you don't like as, as much, it means you like the other one even more, you know? So it's, it all works out. And this album in particular, um, God, I mean, I, I listen to it almost every day. No exaggeration. Um, it's stunning, like the production. Actually, the strings, and I should shout out Tali, who arranged the strings on 1978, too. She's, I mean, wow. she co-wrote with me. She yeah. co-wrote Saturday Night. And, you you um, lucked out. Dark Side of the Sun, big time. And she, <laughs> she did the string arrangements yeah. on Dark Side of the Sun and on Let's Get It. We listen to this a lot, you know, Beck's mm. dad's arrangements, and we, we, we nerd out over all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. you know, we really, um, we love this. And, and the songwriting is so interesting and unusual. And I also love that he did it in his kitchen. He did it at, at home. He did mm. it at his house. And he was like, I don't know. Yeah. Had some friends over and, hey, do you want to be on the record? Like, I love that kind of spirit, um, which I feel like is very indie you know, and he's still indie somehow, yeah, you know, yeah, even though know. he's like one of the biggest artists. And he's just like, I don't know, like, I want to try something new or something old. Yeah. Like, just whatever. Like, let's try it. I feel, I feel like Jack White is kind of like that, too. It's like, let's just try it. Yeah. You know, I yeah. hope I never lose that. Like, let's just try it. Like, I feel like everything yeah. good is like Daft Punk. Everybody's like, mm, let's try it. You know, so that that album, even as gorgeous as it ended up being has a very like, let's just try it. Like it feels very mm -hmm. homemade. Mm -hmm. Expensive, but homemade, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's that blend, you know. Um, Eric Dolphy, Out to Lunch. So when I was on Blue Note, everybody used to ask me, you know, what's your favorite, I had to get these interviews. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your favorite Blue Note album and I'd say Out to Lunch. And there was always this like this pause, like, really? <laughs> <laughs> the same thing when I'm like, Nirvana's my favorite yeah, band. They're like, yeah. Out to Lunch. and. I think this is one of the most kind of like um, cutting edge records like in jazz. Mm. Like there's no piano on it. So already it's like, oh. Yeah, what like, year was this? Um, I don't know. Let me see. This it was... Like, like late 50s, 60s? Yeah. They don't always put them on there. Help me out. Where are that? We're having a record moment. Uh, is the year not on there? Am I crazy? Yeah, it's just the reissued year. Right. Well, I mean, I would guess, like, it looks like 58, maybe, 59. Maybe. I mean, it's his... Early 60s. Yeah, his... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll insert it here. We'll dub over our faces. <laughs> just hold the record up. Exactly. It came out in... <laughs> um, you know, like, his, his compositions are so unusual. And I have to give Blue Note their props for, you know, in this era, just really like signing people like, you know, Andrew Hill, him, building off what they had done with Thelonious Monk. Just like, they know, they knew it wasn't going to sell. That's what I mean. It was, oh, yeah, right. It's not like, it's not commercial music, right. it, but it's important. And they're like, we need to document this because this is a composer who's coming to fruition at the time, you know? Mm. And I feel like Eric Dolphy kind of gets a bad rap, you know, maybe now with like Andre 3000 playing flute, <laughs> people will come back around and kind of right, right, think right, like, yeah. oh, Eric Dolphy, yeah. because he yeah. was, I feel like you can trace that connection or like George Ann Muldrow or like anything that's a little bit left of center. He was like repping that super hard. Um, like he made Charles Mingus look conservative in a way mm. and he actually influenced john coltrane like tremendously right yeah i was yeah i was pulling out this this album underneath that Which just one? that just came out oh yeah yeah yeah. evenings at the village gate right yeah they played together yeah i mean he they used to practice together you know he played bass clarinet he played flute he played alto. right right yeah um it and, creates a really cool sound i mean i really really dig that record and it's it's crazy. It was just a mic test. It wasn't even meant to be recorded. Oh, really? That's yeah. crazy. The guy r running the board or whatever, he was just wanted to experiment with this new microphone mm. uh, at that venue and just sort of hung it somewhere and just as a test recorded their sessions. It was crazy. Insane. I got to get this. Yeah, it just came out. Wow. 
Um, I brought Voodoo. Which oh, yeah. I know I said I didn't have a favorite D'Angelo record, but I mean, this was <laughs> such a game changer. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I actually ran into James Poyser in Philly three months ago. So he said, we're going to write some stuff, which is, um, I've been waiting all my life. Yeah. Um, you know, again, like Jay Dilla's influence is so strong. And and, mm -hmm. and and there are just some albums that are like before and after, you know, and like everything like that yeah. we're mentioning, Black Radio and all this kind of stuff with Glasper, the whole scene completely changed after this album came out. Um, yeah. I've been able to work with some of the musicians like Pina Palladino on here. Um, and that's amazing. You know, he was on No Beginning, No End. Um, one. He was on Lean On Me with the Bill Withers tribute. He's incredible. Um, and, you know, this is kind of like that same thing of like looking to the 70s, looking to that musicianship, that band, um, trying to do something that's got a singer songwriter vibe, but like a little bit different, you know, and bring it to the future. So this was a, a huge influence too. And it just sounds like, mm -hmm. God, you just. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You're just yeah. right there. Um, yeah. What else do we got in the bag? We got a lot. These are some I had laying around the house. Michael, we, we talked about. Love in a Time of Madness was my most controversial Blue Note record. Um, I guess I, I convinced them to. Oh, yeah. Look at that. I did it. I finally did it. <laughs> I, got the, I got the explicit lyrics. Um, and... This was actually produced here in, in LA by uh, Terrio Holmes. And I love this, you know, I feel like a lot of people sleep on this record. Um, even though, funny enough, Live Your Fantasy, it was kind of like my Dylan Goes Electric moment, you know, where like <laughs> yeah. everyone hated the album and loved the single. Okay, um, yeah. Live Your Fantasy was like number one international right, hit. Right, right, yeah. And everyone loved it and everyone's like, I, I hate your album, you know, basically. Mm. But play that song on yeah. the album, you know? Yeah. But man, Molly Music's on here. Um, Tali and, and Molly Music co-wrote a song called Let It Fall. Alita Adams is on here on a song, again, co-written with Tali. Um, and yeah, there's, um, oh no, To Be With You is the one that she wrote with Molly Music, but he's on Let It Fall. This was like my acknowledgement Maybe I'm, me and Christian Scott, um, Chief Adjur, are the only two who are like, we'll acknowledge trap music exists in jazz. You know what I mean? I might get in trouble with that one, but it's kind of <laughs> true, you know, um, and Glassberg. And I was like, yeah, I want to make a, I want to make a contemporary album. Yeah. I want to, I want to go all the way. And my jazz people were like, he's left us. Mm. He'll never come back. And I was like, man, I just want to make yeah music i don't want yeah. to always do stuff i yeah we're gonna get on a tangent there but yeah. exactly <laughs> uh, look at that cover shot by jeanette in amsterdam um this is my homage oh, to you're, classic you're sorry yeah the strange fruit that uh, strange fruits on this yeah, right oh exactly that your rendition of that was just like i had stopped what i was doing Thank and you. just like had to absorb that <laughs> yeah it's like dang that was super hard to do that don i can't was, i can't imagine <laughs> yeah don was produced that and i was grateful um and then, actually let me shout out don for a second he he's such a incredible musician and producer and really supported me during my tenure at blue note he, i was the first artist he signed on the don was um oh. era yeah with okay. no beginning no end one and he produced this one and you know it was the band was incredible um john patitucci on bass eric carlin on drums jason moran on piano it, just mind-blowing and don was like hey because i told him i want to do a tribute to billy and he was like okay do you need help with charts or like arrangements no mm. I'm cool. okay you know the band i was like ah can you help me get the band he's like okay so do i need to send anything to them and i was like no <laughs> And when I showed up to the to Sear Sound, yeah, they're like, "So what are we playing?" And I was like, "They had no idea." And I was like, "Well, I heard about this club called Bradley's in the '80s. It closed in the '80s in New York, and it was like the spot mm. where like everybody would go. Yeah, you know, it would really feature like jazz piano players. 
And at 2 a.m., they would shut it down and they would like close the, the grate, but musicians would stay and it would stay open until nine in the morning. So like from two wow. to nine, that's when like the real music would start actually. Yeah. And it was like the spot. It was like the legendary place. And like Jean Patitucci was old enough to be part of that. The other guys had kind of heard about it. Yeah. They weren't quite old enough to have. Yeah, but Junior yeah, Mance yeah. was like there every night. He would tell me about coming out. Oh, they'd open the grate. It would be nine in the morning. And you'd be stumbling out. The light would hit you and everyone's going to work, you know? And so I was like, I want, I want it to feel like we're at Bradley's. And it's yeah, three in the morning. Yeah. And we just started playing. And they're like, oh, really? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And, and yeah. then we just started. We just started. Wow. And literally every single track was done uh, in a, in a, except Strange Fruit, which w was done in like a, I don't even know what to call it, like a dream. Mm. Like we just started playing. Yeah. And then the album was done. And I literally, we were like, should we take a break? Yeah, yeah. And I walked in the control room and said, hey, Don, what's next? And he's like, that's the album. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you recorded everything. And all of us were like in shock. And he wow. showed us, like we didn't even remember recording wow. half of this album seriously. We were like, really? So we did it in like three hours, like the whole thing. Dang. One, just one, everything's a first take. And it's wow. weird, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> and then Strange Fruit, we did the next day. And, and okay. Don was, so Don was there, he was listening with this. And he was just, he saw we were in a vibe and he just let us vibe. Yeah, that's which cool. Which is like a very cool thing yeah. for a producer to do. Yeah. He was like, you guys got it. I'm gonna make sure it's all rolling. Everything looks yeah, right. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Then the next day, Strange Fruit, I told him I had this uh, concept to use a loop kind of. Yeah. Because at home I was practicing with a loop station. So I was like, I want to recreate it, set up a loop. And we had a lot of people in the studio. He had a... Um, a Japanese film crew documenting him. I actually had a Japanese film crew <laughs> documenting this record. What? And then Tali what? was directing the EPK of okay. behind the scenes. So it was like literally yeah. three film crews. And Don, I was like, man, we gotta get everybody out. He's like, yeah, everybody out. Yeah. Just kicked it, like 30 people kicked everybody Dang, out. That's, yeah. And it was just me, him, Tali, and, um, and the engineer. And I was like, I need you to like, I was like, I'm going to like go to an emotional place mm. and I need you to just like, you know, run it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he was like, I, I got you. And it was so cool because like, I can't, even now I can't like look at that song or that performance objectively. Mm. And he was able to, which I needed him to do. Yeah. Produce it mm. and be like, okay, that was good. But like, I think try doing this, you know, like add harmony here or whatever, you know, and I needed somebody to be like, this is powerful. This is wrenching. And also we're making music. So I want to get it right. So he really, yeah. you know, took me there. So that was cool. And yeah, JB, Jeanette Beckman took the, the shot in Amsterdam. And this was like my homage to like the classic fifties. Yeah. Blue. And I was, I was like, I got to do one yeah. that looks like, yeah blue note you know like traditional blue note so that was really cool it's kind of funny to see them i know I was side by say, side yeah <laughs> like is that the same guy yeah um but i love that i love that about you i guess i, I wear a lot of glasses to the side actually I'm, I'm seeing this about myself it's kind of funny yeah <laughs> um it's a good look though thank you yeah what else do i got here man i think that's it yeah and the dreamer i guess i didn't really talk about it but you know this was my first album and I made it um, actually on 27th Street, which used to be Tin Pan Alley mm. in New York, which yeah. is really funny. Like after a long session, I went out to wait for a cab and like knocked over a bag of trash. And under that trash was like a plaque saying like, this was Tin Pan Alley, you know, <laughs> like the famous. I was like, that's so New York. Yeah. It's just on the ground and just covered by trash. Like yeah, that's... Yeah. Um, but you remember the Matrix, like, you remember, like, the building that's, like, black and white tiles where he first meets Morpheus? It's all, like, weird. Oh, and yeah, yeah. That's what this studio felt like. like oh, a crazy. A weird dream. It was definitely haunted. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, 
definitely haunted. Like I remember yeah. there was like a mirror that would like, it was set up in a room and like sometimes it would like shake. Like it was definitely, there was like yeah. energy. Something going on Not there. Not negative, yeah, but yeah. you were like, okay. You didn't go to the bathroom by yourself in that place. It was down the hall. It was like, yeah. go to the bathroom, like look out. It was just like, there was some weird. But they had a great piano and a beautiful Neumann mic, which it became my signature. Um, that vintage like mm. Neumann warm yeah sound yeah. you know I've yeah. used some form of Neumann mic on pretty much everything yeah yeah I've noticed that about it. like there's some there's that I mean obviously it's your voice but there is this ineffable quality to your voice that I just I really dig it's like this warmth but it's also like very soothing mm. uh, so that's got to be part of the magic sauce there that it is. That, I'm, I'm just impressed you used ineffable in a sentence. I'm like, is. that's amazing. Yeah, that's like, well, that's I like the visual pull quote of like the <laughs> <laughs> ineffable. Jose James. <laughs> the new hit album, hey, Ineffable. Don't forget your roots. Let's, let's stay um, humble now. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. It's, um, it's, a, it's a Billie Holiday technique, actually. Oh. Yeah, because basically before, before her, um, excuse me. Go for it. I love these. <laughs> Before the era before her, you know, like like little Jimmy Rushing or like these kind of like big band singers, they would have a megaphone. There was no amplification, oh. so they had these huge voices and they would hold up a megaphone, right, right, because they right, were singing right. with big bands. Yeah, of course. So there was, I mean, it's hard for us to like conceive of like no amplification, right? But like there just wasn't; it didn't exist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, they were just playing, and the singer had to like put that megaphone up and not a electronic one, but just like a, yeah, you see them in pictures, they hold it up and then they <laughs> would sing through that. Um, or they would go in between the tables and sing. Right. To, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah which yeah. Billy did in Harlem. Yeah. But for, um, when they invented the microphone, you know, it was people like Bing Crosby, Billy Holiday, Ella, people who didn't have these huge mm -hmm. voices. Yeah. Billy Holiday had a very, relatively yeah. small voice you know yeah. her range her power was much smaller you know um yeah and she's my favorite jazz singer just for the record and so she would use this close mic technique so it and marvin used it too mm. where it made it made you feel like you, they were like whispering in your ear yeah so you could kind of get these new um nuances that never existed before where you could like whisper and you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I've always used that too. And Chet Baker. Um, All right, yeah. It's his. That's his whole thing. Yeah. You know, just like a, like a cloud. You know, <laughs> just like a sad cloud. Yeah. You know. Um, and yeah, I mean, I didn't know. I mean, I guess it's not fair for of me to say I didn't know what I was doing. Because I I I knew what I was doing, in a specific way. Yeah. And I guess like any like young producers or. Um, performers out there, this is for them. It's like, I knew how to do what I knew how to do. Yeah. If somebody said produce an album for someone else, I couldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. But I knew I had a sound and I knew how to capture that sound. Yeah. And I didn't know that I was producing. I literally made a demo uh, and it to, went to London for this jazz competition, lost the competition, which was the second international competition I had lost. <laughs> and then I was yeah. passing out my EP and when copy got to Giles Peterson and when he he got it I didn't know he had a label because it was it wasn't announced yet and he said I have this new label Brownswood I would love to sign you it was like oh my god this is this this, this is a dream yeah yeah and I was living in New York and obviously they're in London so they were like yeah well you you produce the first EP so just make the album <laughs> and I was like Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I just did. And, yeah. I, and I didn't like question myself. But I think if I had questioned myself, it would have all fallen apart. I would have brought someone else in or like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I was like, well, he loved, he loved what I did. So I know how to do that. Just do that and keep doing that. And I actually made 28 tracks on The Dreamer. Wait, um, wait, what? Yeah. The original session. 28 tracks. 28 tracks, yeah. Are they, these all original? Uh, some of them, a lot of them were original. Some of them were covers. 
Um, some of them are so weird. No one will ever. <laughs> I went through. Actually, it's funny. It's funny. Yeah. So um, I went through like the hard drive of like the original session and we pulled it up because I was like, maybe I'll release everything. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. I will not release everything. Some of the stuff was like very just like weird experimental stuff. I was like literally just calling up my friends, I guess, Beck style. Like, yeah, hey man, I got the yeah. studio. Studio was very reasonable. So I booked it out for like a long time, you know, um, not D'Angelo 10 years time, but you know, <laughs> a couple of weeks, you know, which for jazz is like 10 years. Yeah. And so I had people come in and try stuff and some stuff was very weird. You know, you, the, the, the trick is you listen the next day. Yeah. Cause you feel great about everything when you leave the studio. You're right. Like, Yo, right. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the next morning you're like, whoa, like, I, yeah, did I we, <laughs> did we do that? <laughs> Have you, know? have, have you heard a Carnival of Light? No. Okay, so the Beatles did this. Oh. It's never been released. Oh. Only very few people have actually heard it, and most people are like, yeah, you, you don't want to hear it. That's funny. <laughs> but it's them, it's them just improvising right. for like 28 minutes. Wow. Or so. But yeah, that just immediately, like, I'm right. sure they did that. <laughs> like, They're like, nah. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. And then and then I had Jazz Peterson, who is like one of the greatest DJs and selectors in the world, who went through and he just, I think he changed the set list, or the track listing like 30 times, you know. I mean, yeah. he, I got to really give it to him. Like he loved The Dreamer. He loved that album, like deeply, like maybe even more than I did, <laughs> like for real. Yeah. And he, um, shout out to, to Freestyle Fellowship and Micah Nine. Um, he was the one who said I should do the Park Bench People cover, which really changed my my life because first of all, it was very hard. Um, there was no genius.com back then. So I was transcribing all the lyrics and trying oh, to figure out right. Micah Nine's flow, um, which was, uh, it, for me coming from transcribing Coltrane, it was the same thing. And I've always seen it rap and, and jazz is like the same concept. Why did I not just think of that right now? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I was transcribing, yeah. Yeah. You know, trying to get the, the flow right in the lyrics. And then, um, you know, Giles really helped me because I was ready to just be like Mr. Suit and Tie back then. And he was like, I like that too, but he's like, but you're young and you're hip hop. Like, that's your whole thing. He was like, yeah, I feel like you could just wear that Yankees cap if you want, fit it and like, why don't you do a hip hop cover? So he suggested I did it and it kind of changed the game, you know, like for me, it was like, oh, this guy, he, he obviously knows about Sinatra and Ella and Billy, yeah. knows, but he's bringing his own thing a little bit. Um, and then as kind of, cause again, it's, it's hard for people to like, remember this, but like, this was, it was like me and Glasper were kind of the only ones doing it live. Um, of our generation. Obviously, Branford Marsalis had Buckshot Le Funk, and which people panned him for unfairly because that was such a cool, brave album. And, you know, on the hip hop side, you had like Guru, Jasmine Taz, and you had Digwa Planets. You had a lot of like rappers pulling right, in jazz. Right, right, right. But the other way around was like, yeah. It was not accepted. People were not happy about it, they didn't like it. Um, and to be honest, a lot of them still don't like it. You know, the, the jazz police. But I, yeah. mm. in London, London is like so open-minded. So they're like, right. oh, cool. This is where jazz is going now. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And so I went from being like literally a guy that nobody knew working at Starbucks uh, and then at the new school, right. checking out amps to playing North Sea jazz. I was like, hey, I got to quit my job. They're like, why? I was like, I got it. I'm going on tour. Yeah. <laughs> like, How cool is like, that? <laughs> I got I want to play North Sea jazz and like Montreux and everybody was just like, what? <laughs> that dude the guy in the equipment room yeah it was like yeah actually um so I'll, I'll always be grateful and you know when i made this album i was like i may never make another album again this might be my, my yeah. one shot yeah and not in like a dark way but just like if if yeah I, I told myself i was like if this is my only album i want people to like look back and be like yo that kid jose james did something cool and people love it, man. It's I'm grateful. You know, this is the expanded uh, version that has the Coltrane covers, which we weren't able to release 
in 2008. So I, I did, I wrote lyrics to Equinox, Central Park West, and Resolution. Um, and then I wrote a song called Coltrane, Dear Alice, that was never released, that we, it was an original that we were able to release. Is that just this. for like clearance reasons or just like money? It was, it was clearance, too expensive? Yeah, it was clearance reasons. Okay, yeah. 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 And I also, so basically I released them as without any publishing because mm. I wanted them to be out. So that's the yeah. tricky thing. You have to right. rename it if you write lyrics to, like John Hendricks did that in the 50s because he wrote lyrics to like everything. Right. And so right. like when Carmen McRae did his version of like Monk or Horace Silver or whatever, they had to like rename it something right, else. Right, right. Yeah, I just learned about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, I, I've just grown. Back then I cared so much about it and I had a publishing deal mm. with like Bucks and it was like, I need to give my point. And I'm, now I'm like, I'm yeah. on the other side of all that. No, no diss to mm -hmm. get your money, you know, but now yeah, I'm like, absolutely, yeah. just put it out. Like, let the people hear it, you know, like, right. it's fine. It's a good song. You know, it's it's Coltrane's song. I didn't write it, you know. Right. But I was younger. I was younger then. I was like, my, they're my lyrics and I got to have my name on it, mm -hmm. you know. And they're like, yeah. yeah, cool. So you can't put it out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fair, you know. Yeah. The, 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 the ego of youth, man, you know. So looking back, like we're, what? well, today we're 16, about 16 years away or from when that came out like looking at 1978 compared to this mm. like what's changed what's kind of stayed the same for you that is a great question i think what stayed the same is my love for um musicians mm. you know that's what yeah that's what I think that's why people come to my shows you know obviously like i guess people like the way i sing too but <laughs> they I'm, I'm known now for putting together like killer bands. Yeah. Like everyone's like, who's in this band now? You know? Mm -hmm. um, and I got to shout out Eben Dorsey and Diana Jabbar who played um, horns on, on and on. They're like up and coming. But my bands are always, I hope, cutting edge and, you know, um, interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think I've kept that. Um, there is a deep love I have for like the people that I collaborate with. And I've never lost that, which I'm grateful for. Um, yeah. I think, you know, I think this is a really good question, you know, and I'm going to think about it more, but I think it's like, I want to give something of myself. And I think people kind of feel like artists or creative people do that sort of like naturally and like willingly, mm. but that's not always the case. Like okay. it's often for me at least, it's a very sort of like vulnerable, painful place to like share something because as you know, it's like you put a piece of yourself in the marketplace <laughs> and then <laughs> and you get that like one, <clears throat> one bad review or one bad, you know, comment on social media, whatever it is. Yeah. Or even just like a homie, like not being like, yo, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, this is my life. You know, like when you put your, real self into it which i did with the dreamer and certainly on 78 too um it's vulnerable it's 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 hard and, and i feel like the difference is back then i didn't know who my fans were because i didn't have any right so i'm just putting it out there and the effect was like like people loved it so i got that like rush of like mm. oh man they love me you know i'm playing glastonbury like like what you know what I mean? Um, and now it's interesting because like this will be my 12th album, I believe. And I know very much what people like, you know, yeah. like who they like, which Jose James they like, which hairstyle they like, you know, um, which era they like, which musicians they want me to collaborate with. Like I know way too much, you know. Um, but I think what's changed is back then I did it for the music. I was like, I want to make this album to celebrate John and Alice Coltrane and Billie Holiday and my heroes and sheroes. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, obviously I still have my, my musical heroes, but now I'm like, I want my fans to feel uplifted. I want them to feel like mm. uplifted and also, because yeah. 78 is divided into two sections, party and politics, which to me that sums up the 70s. That's like the two sides of the yin and yang you know what i mean yeah. if you think about it yeah so the first half is party 
And I want I want people to feel like, oh man, Jose James like did his thing. He, yeah. I can put this on with with my my homies. I can put this on with my significant other or somebody I'm trying to make my significant other, and and it'll create a vibe. You know. So that was the goal of that. Yeah. Um, but it worked. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then the the, yeah. the 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 last half is like okay. And we're also, we've been through some things like as a society, you know, in this, this era we're in, like we've gone through a lot and we're about to go through a lot. So how can I use my platform to shine some light on um, a global perspective, working with Shenya Franca down in in, uh, Brazil and Bahia, working with Balaji in Antwerp uh, in the Congo, you know, to you know, in their in their ways, him in French and her in, in Portuguese. Yeah. Talk about their communities, talk about their experiences and kind of have a wider framework of what the black experience is. And that has changed. I think the the way that we can kind of see what is black, what is the black experience, that has changed a lot since two thousand eight. Because right. now it's like it's not a huge deal for Beyonce to do a a collaboration with all African artists. Everyone's excited about that, you know, or like Wakanda, you know, you know what I mean? Like Black yeah, yeah. Panther is like, oh yeah. yeah, this is cool now. This is like, this is global. This is, it definitely wasn't the case back then, you know, um, you, you know, you had your yeah, like yeah. Michael Jackson, you know, in Brazil or like, but that was very kind of like rare, you know? Um, and I think I, you know, hopefully I'm, still growing as an artist, you know, hopefully I'm still reaching people. I think that's the, the key. Um, but yeah, that's the main thing that's changed. Now I'm thinking about how is this going to be received? Not in a commercial way necessarily, but like, is it going to move someone? Mm-hmm. Cause if I'm not doing that, like, what's the point? That's what COVID knocked yeah. into me. It was like, yeah. what are you doing this for? You're doing mm-hmm. this to get another magazine cover or right. sell more. Right copies to buy some clothes and you know what I mean it's like I mean we all gotta make money but it was like what's the what's the what's behind it you mm-hmm. know um mm-hmm. and music during the pandemic helped me it like healed me right it's like I'm putting on Stevie Wonder to like make make my day better and that was like oh right like that's what this is all about like yeah stop thinking about is streaming good or bad or is all that stuff you know it's like who cares like make the music because that is how i can help somebody yeah hopefully yeah and and i'll never meet those people that's the kind of cool thing like tali and i talk about this all the time like we are like the world's biggest like andrew bird fans we love andrew bird I just saw him. Yeah. We love Andrew Bird. Yeah. Like, we yeah. listen to Andrew Bird like yeah. all the time. Like we go in the car, Noble Beast. It's like boom. Road trip, Noble Beast. Right? We've never met him. We don't like, you know, follow him on like social media. Right. Yeah. No yeah. offense. We love you, you know. Yeah. But like we're not like typical fans. He would never know that we're but we like he's like top my top Spotify guy mm-hmm. most years, you know. And like that's the weird thing about this moment now. We've only seen him once in concert. You know what I mean? We didn't meet him. Right. We even have friends in his band. We've never. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. We know his bass yeah. player. You know. Yeah. But like, that's kind of this weird moment of now where it's like, the people who hear 1978, and get moved by some. I may never meet mm-hmm. ever. Um, and so I just have to kind of know that whatever I'm putting out there will reach that person. And I'm, I'm grateful that it can, you know, and that's the cool thing yeah. about now is, um, cause Spotify didn't exist actually when the dreamer came out. Um, maybe it did in, in, in right, Sweden, right, right. you know right. what I mean? Yeah. But it wasn't in London, certainly wasn't in the States. Right. And I think it is kind of cool to have, you know, kind of the world's library at the touch of your fingers, you know, I, I do like that part. I will always listen to something on vinyl first. Yeah. Because I do feel like it makes me feel a certain way. Um, and when I, man, when we dropped the needle on 1978, a couple of days ago, I was like, oh my God. 
Yeah. Because I know I'm, I'm I'm jumping all over, but it's like you mix it, you listen to it, you listen on these, these studio headphones, you listen on these like beautiful like you know tens of thousand dollar monitors, and then you know like you get it in your like phone, and you're like, all right, yeah, it yeah. loses a little bit of the magic, you know, yeah, yeah. And then when you drop the the needle, um, and it's a different press is what we did a uh, specific press with with Agri right Road. right you're like wow like I mean, you kind of have to you have to yeah exactly exactly and you're like man this is this is different it just moves me i don't know yeah and you know what i like about it too just to nerd out for a second <laughs> i love like it's kind of like reading a book yeah versus like an audio book because you have to turn the page Right. There's a physical, mm. there's a, there's yeah. a interaction yeah. you have to do. You get to the end of the page, you turn the page. Yeah. You have to go back to the top of the page. No, just the audiobooks. And, you know, my mother-in-law swears by them. You know, <laughs> she's like, she's trying to give a new, you know, yeah. shout out to Marcy Vermin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but with vinyl, it's like, yeah, you get to side A, it stops. You got to get up. You got to go. You got to yeah. move it over, flip it over. You know, and and I I like that moment, like because I think it gives you like time to process what you've listened to. Mm. Actually, yeah. You know, I mean, if, if no one's ever timed it, but it's probably like two minutes by the time you like get up, right? Note or even notice it. Sometimes you're like, oh, just I, I right, gotta. right. So let's <laughs> say two to ten minutes, you know? Yeah. And and it's like, yeah, you're processing that that side A. Um, and then when it hits, there's that moment where it's like you hear the, the vinyl, you hear the needle. Mm, yeah. And it's like that yeah. that warmth, and you can kind of feel that the movement of the the vinyl, mm. you know. And then the first track comes on, and you're like, oh, it's, it's like it's like stepping into a bath for me. It's like yeah, ooh. yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's it's it uh, never gets old. I will yeah, tell you that. Like yeah. I signed um, 500 white labels of because uh, Giles did put out like a white label of the the Coltrane stuff for free you know we're like he's like I got it because he was like yeah. obsessed by it. so we yeah. did white labels and I signed 500 which is why my signature looks like two <laughs> candy canes now because I was like I was uh, sitting in London it was hot yeah you know in the yeah. summer and I was outside and just I was like James and numbering them all I was like oh my god and that yeah it takes takes longer than you think but I I really love um you know, I love that somebody's gonna have this, you know, in their house and like, you know, and look at it. I mean, I guess, I guess that part hasn't changed. You know, when I saw this photo, you know, which is an homage to Miles Davis. You know, um, I'm big on uh, homage. You know, I'm big on the I visual that, thing. Yeah. I was like, wow, like somebody's gonna see this in like a record store. Yeah, like that never gets old to me. Like to walk into a record store, like amoeba or mm -hmm. whatever and just be yeah. like yo like like that's my album like i don't know that's yeah that's more thrilling than like new music friday to me you know like yeah all love like i'm grateful for the love you know like for, trust me like i love spotify right. and i love all of that but like i'll never because that's how i really discovered music was like the new you know tribe called quest was like oh you see the cover first. I know. And you're yeah, like, I yeah. want the thing. I want, I need that thing. I need to yeah. open it. I need to read it. I need to learn every single thing about an artist, you know? Um, so that's why, you know, like, like I love the internet and I definitely like stream their first record or whatever, but I was like, I got to get on vinyl because I need to, I need to read about them. I need to like yeah. experience it a little bit more deeply. And I think that's, that's the thing that will never change for me. Like, everything's got to be on vinyl yeah i think that's awesome i think definitely i wish everything could be not everything right. can but like and also there's sort of like a, a permanency of it right it's like stamped it's pressed it lives on its life and it's going to go through different owners over time um and people are going to leave their marks on it but mm -hmm. it'll, it'll more than likely outlive you right you know and there's there's something about like you know i like obviously the affordability of a repress but to find like you know that elvis presley up there that's that's an original i mean the record does not play it has a chunk missing but mm. 
I keep it because the cover, you know, the cover's so cool. That Dark Side is a 73 UK press, but like, I don't know, there's something, uh, I forget who said it. I think it was Gas Lamp Killer or something. Anyway, somebody was just talking about like, especially with the days of tape, mm. like there's something that's captured that even when you go back to the original tape, it's like, you know, tape, tape ages, it does, you know, and it's the way, the way we cut stampers are different now or the, the lathe cut and all that. So it's just like, and also like, uh, like De La Soul had such issues with their clearing their samples. Like for the right. longest time you couldn't get their stuff newly pressed. That's like they right. just, they couldn't do it. And then to like not have those samples would be a you know a crime. Um, so yeah, it's just like, and I know like guys like Kanye are constantly tweaking their mm. their stuff, you know, his stuff, and it's like, yeah, to have it like in that form because like things can come down from Spotify or things can change or it can go away, but you you own that, you know. I don't I don't know. There's something know still magical about it. I know what you mean. It's like <laughs> it is magic. Yeah, it is magic. Um, and shout out to Echo Bass who does our vinyl. They're in uh, near Atlanta. Oh yeah, the U.S. You know those guys? No. Well, I was gonna yeah. ask where that was a question. I was gonna ask about that because that's that's a whole logistics. That's a whole another thing. Yeah, you gotta um, you gotta plan that stuff. Exactly. We just started working with them, um, and I love them. They're they're in Athens. Uh, oh, nice. Okay, yeah. 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 And. They're just like us, man. They just like nerd out about this stuff. Mm. Like they sent me a video I posted on my socials, like of the plant, like just actually seeing it being like oh, pressed, that's so cool. cut, yeah, cooled, like the whole thing. And it's like, yeah, that's that's cool, you know, because you feel like you're part of this cool like cycle where yeah. it's like, yeah, I've 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 made this, I've written this, I've produced this, the musicians recorded it, you know, whatever, like we we performed it. Now it's been like mixed. Now it's been like mastered. You know, now boom in the artwork. Now it's here's the next part, and he's like literally just like stamping them out, and you're just like, whoa, like this is crazy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's made in the USA. Um, it sounds great. You know, we're trying to do a lot more work with them, and we we do some overseas stuff too as well. Um, but shout out to them. Nice. Place. They're they're dope. Yeah. So a lot of my viewers are um, big Beatles fans. So I always have to ask uh, open-ended question, but if like I'm scared, I'm scared. No, Wait, no, drink some more water. <laughs> no, no. It's just I'm just curious. Which is like, your favorite Beatle? No, no, none of that. John. Um, well, hey, <laughs> it's more. It's more of like you, you can be whatever you want, but I'm just curious. Like what? Like what's the first thing that comes to mind when, I, when we talk about the Beatles, for mm. instance? I mean, obviously. They are who they are, but like Honestly, for, for you and your music and yeah. yeah, my mom loved the Beatles. I mean, that's her generation, you know. Like yeah, she was one of the screaming girls, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, they're right, right behind you there. You know, she, you know, she played. She had all this stuff, so I would, I would, kind of made my way through her um, collection. Yeah, and the Beatles, man. I mean, it's. They're just like the OGs, man. Like mm. I don't even know. I don't even know how to talk about the Beatles because, like, I can't think of any other band. Like I talk about these before and after. Yeah, like yeah. Picasso, you know, right? Just, you know what I mean? Where you're like, there was life as we knew it and music as we knew it, and then there was like the Beatles, and then it, they changed everything. Yeah. Um, and I think we talked about this before with like being able to see like when Nirvana or with jazz artists, a band or songwriters evolve in real time. You can see that with the Beatles, which yeah, is yeah. fascinating. Um, and it's sort of like, um, even beyond the music, it's like, a, um, templates, not the right word, but like a manual or the Bible. John would, would love that. I said that, um, <laughs> for like, our society, you know, it's like normal guys, you know, I mean, normal, but yeah, you know, Liverpool lads, you know, hanging out, messing around, boom, all of a sudden turn into like something that has never, ever happened ever. Right. Ever. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are like things that obviously, you know, like Bessie Smith, she's selling like million copies 
what? You know, like Billie Holiday being like the the biggest black star in the world like at the time, you know, or Louis Armstrong, you know, like there were huge things that happened in music. Um, but the Beatles was like, literally no human being had ever experienced that level of like, what we now call fame. Yeah. They didn't even know what to call it then because it never happened. Right. So like, it's kind of like, even now with, with I know it's like, it's been exhaustively documented and I don't think we really understand what happened on like a, like a social level. You know, like I'm reading the Oppenheimer book mm. and it's like, I'm, I'm reading how they like grappled with the idea of like, we've figured out how to do this, but we shouldn't. But like also now everyone knows and like, it's going to happen. Like, right. I feel like that's yeah. what happened with the Beatles. It was like, yeah. we all love music. And then it was like, oh no, we've stumbled onto like, <laughs> like the atomic bomb of like, of fame and of like things literally exploding overnight to a point where they couldn't handle it. Um, and you know, I, I watched the documentary, the recent one, and, and it made me sad because like, you see how much they loved each other and like yeah. how that kind of pressure, nobody could have withstood it, you know? Yeah. And they were so brilliant, you know? Um, and what a great band. I mean, they're a great band, like, yeah. straight up, man. Like they're just like yeah. putting it down, you know? And I gotta make my, my plug for Billy Preston, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. That, when I saw that in the doc, when they were like, yo, let's get Billy. Yeah. And like make him a, uh, I was like, yo, if that would have just happened, like if Paul could have been a little bit more chill about that, because I know, you know, he was probably like, yo, that was my spot, you know. Right. Yeah. But like, if that would have happened and it would have been like that five piece, it would have been like Nirvana with Pat Smear. That would have been crazy. <laughs> yeah. That would be because all of a sudden, yeah. you know, you go back and listen to those and they, I can't even call them records, man. Like. They were just messing around. Again, they were just like, I don't know. Like they're sitting in a room like this. Yeah. That's what I love. They, and this is what I mean. It's like they weren't trying to do what they did. Right. They were just trying to make. And that's what I feel like everybody misses. You know, it's like they weren't trying to do that. They weren't trying to be the biggest band in the world. They were just mm -hmm. trying to make cool records. And they liked a bunch of these black artists. And they knew every like weird song from Liverpool. Yeah. They were just like music nerds, man. Yeah. And Ringo was like the, the local badass drummer. Yeah. That, you know, he was the, um, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he was, it was yeah. kind of like Nirvana, actually. Like the drummer changed and all of a sudden it went like, it exploded. And all of a sudden the songwriting went like crazy too. Yeah. I mean, I know, you know, I'm kind of tongue in cheek. I know like that um, Kurt Cobain loved the Beatles too, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And that was a yeah. big influence. But it's, you know, we can never put the genie back in the bottle. Mm. And also, no one's ever going to get to that level, probably because they're trying to. It's like a weird thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, they just, it, it just, it was magic. And it was the timing. And they also yeah. weren't trying. You know? Also, I got to say, I love Yoko Ono. I know that's probably divisive, but she's amazing. Yeah. And, and I, and I, in my in my like alternate universe fantasy, they could have found a way to like encompass all of that, and I think they could have if they weren't that famous, and they didn't have right, so much right. pressure and all right. this like. I mean, I can't even imagine the pressure they were under. You know, it's literally I can't imagine it. You know. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting to think like if they could have just held out a little bit longer because I feel like society was changing, you know, and obviously if John had lived, you know, maybe we would have had like the reunion band and all this stuff. You look at the stones and you're like, yeah, man, like, okay, they figured it out. You know, they figured it out and, yeah. and we're able to keep going and, and, and share their music and love and, and that, that energy that they had, you know, and I don't know, the Beatles were just so, innovative man yeah like it's shocking <laughs> you know what i mean like i love mad yeah. lib and i love dylan and i love you know beck i love all these people the beatles got in there first man the beatles were like messing around with tape and doing yeah. crazy stuff you know 
I mean, all love to Hendrix and, and every, but the Beatles were in there like getting weird. Yeah. And, and what, what, I guess what really strikes me like listening now is like how weird a lot of their albums were considering they were the biggest band in the world. Oh yeah. yeah. You're like, wait, yeah. what are well, you doing? Yeah, especially when you get to the White Album. Right. You're like, yo. Piggies? Like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I feel like they don't get enough credit for being like as political as they were to and like trying to push the boundaries. Um, and I know like, I mean, I don't know all the ins and outs, but like some things got changed, but I know they were like very aware of like what was happening in society in, in, right. in, right. in England at the time. And they were doing their best to bring that into their music, you know, and Eastern philosophy and all that stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. Like, you'd be hard pressed to find a band like doing that now who had that level of, or anything close to that level of, of success. I feel like, you know, I don't know, it's, it's like a different thing. It's almost like Bill Withers, you know, where, where it's like he, he walked away from his career and everyone's like, why? He's like, he's like, because I did what I did. Like, they could have easily kept writing i want to hold your hand or like yeah so many so many bands did yeah right exactly and they're like no let's let's make this weird like and let's rock out you know like i don't nothing but respect for them man like um yeah I, now i'm curious about this weird <laughs> this weird what you call uh, it? it's carnival of carnival light, of light. now yeah. i'm like i gotta find it now but yeah, even when you just go by the numbers, right? Fourteen albums, right, in like seven years, roughly, and all before they were thirty. Right, it's crazy. It's shocking. <laughs> I mean, nowadays, all I mean, it's most of the time it's just like a singular entity, mm. like Beyonce, Taylor Swift, mm. Kanye. It's like these mega stars. Rarely do you see like three of the most talented songwriters who ever lived in the last you know fifty years all together, and then <laughs> Ringo. <laughs> I in love defense Ringo. Of Ringo, I like. I, I yo, love him. He kept kids them together. Love his songs. Yeah, and, and yeah. he was he was the he was the one that got that the youth market man. Yeah, Yellow yeah. Submarine. I know, right? Come on, dog. Yo, oh. Serene was like, when I, I was like, yeah. Yo, Serene was my jam when yeah. I was a kid. I was like, o Octopus's Garden as well. On. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it's, I, I think they, they were all equally important. And yeah, like you said, they just, it's just, yeah, no one could contain it, you know? Billy Shears, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Got a ref for Billy Shears, yeah. man. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it's, it is crazy. Like, trying to think of any other maybe crosby stills and nash like young like just those many minds right, in like one right. band where you're like wow well they only made like two records i think exactly <laughs> you know? exactly so i mean more if you anyway we're not right, gonna right, right. we're not gonna yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. another that's another yeah. episode yeah but yeah it is crazy but but i think of them the same it's like they're i don't have a favorite beatles album it's like it's yeah, it's I mean, their work. It's their body of work, you know. I I I go through periods like for a long time it was a white album, and then like I kind of wrote everything off before Rubber Soul. Mm. But lately I've been going back to like Beatles for Sale, mm. and it it it's a defi this decisive record, like because there is some holdovers from their uh, skiffle days, and then there's some like newer stuff. It's a real transitional record. Mm. Uh, but again, it was one of those records they they recorded and like. You know, a couple of days because that's, right. that's all they had right um but yeah i, I kind of go back to like it's almost like the opposite of of your first album but their abbey road their last recorded album even though it came out before you know it's a right. whole thing right but like that was like them with like full intention like let's just let's just do it the way we want to do it mm -hmm. not worry about anything else and so like i think there's some energy to that especially coming from let it be just everything that went wrong with that that mm. we got to see a lot of it that was that, crazy in that documentary but yeah i mean did you suspect a lot of that stuff obviously you're like a, uh, a deep beatles i mean cat. 
I, I guess what happened was I didn't realize how much Billy was involved. Mm. I thought Yoko was way more involved, mm. at least the edit that we saw. Um, she was there, and I'm sure that was kind of like, okay, I guess she's just going to be there. Mm. But like she wasn't like calling the shots. Like it, right. there was this different narrative that I like mm. grew up with. Like Yoko broke them up or this or that. But you know, um, um, why can't I? Oh, Lin, Linda's there, and they, you know, there was right. like it felt like there was more of a family thing going on. Like the, yeah, the, Ringo the ladies were trying to hold these guys down. They're like, <laughs> they're like yo, get up. They're like, hey, you got an album to make, man. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like I, I've been going back to that, but yeah, it, 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 I mean, in some ways magical mystery tour mm. is one of my favorites, even though that, that was not, at least in the form that I love it as was not a Beatles record. Right. So I feel like that with Sgt. Pepper's as a double album mm. would have been like, that would have been my favorite album, but that's, that's fire. You know, it doesn't exist <laughs> that way. But yeah, as a kid though, white, uh, the White Album, I just listen to that nonstop, all the time. I don't know. Classic, man. I mean, they all have merit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Even Please Please Me, you go back to that one, and like four of the songs were singles, and then they recorded the the the, the ten, the rest of the songs, in a in a day. Wow. They just knocked them out, and they saved Twist and Shout for the for the end because. Mm. I think, yeah, and he's going to blow his voice, John. Right. On that, anyway. He did that a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, my thing about music is like, does it make you feel or does it, and, or dance? Which is feeling in, in, in your body, you know? I and love I feel that. Like, I love that. I feel like you can put that litmus test to any of their stuff. It's like, the early stuff? Yeah. Gets the yeah. kids dancing, man. Yeah. Let's go, you know? Yeah. And like, some of the other stuff, you're like, yeah, it makes you feel stuff. Like, Eleanor Rigby, I'm like... Mm. I don't even know who she is, and it's like I feel right. for I feel for this woman. <laughs> right? I mean, it's yeah. like it's haunting. It, it, it remains is. haunting, yeah. and it's like this, like very critical, like like Paul. Can, you know, like I don't know, man. Sometimes they would put the spotlight on like English society and British society, and just in this like cutting way, and you're like, wow, like yeah. how did they get away with that? You know, and be that famous? Like they weren't like niche. You know what I mean? It was like. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you expect that from like some like niche like right, punk right, Roy band Harper. or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but, no. Yeah. Beatles, Beatles go hard, man. <laughs> yeah. um, I should mention Jeanette Beckman is a Stones fan. Okay. Because you know, for her generation, the Beatles. Yeah. Know, it was like no the Stones, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. There was that whole. Yeah. I mean, they had they had their once. I feel like. The Beatles had to go away for them to have their exactly, moment. Exactly, exactly. Because like you have Exile Main Street and all those records at that point, Sticky Fingers even. Right. Like they had that that four album streak where it was just like hit after hit. I mean, it, was it was undeniable. Yeah. yeah. But I think as a songwriter, I always go back to the Beatles catalog because, my God, you know. Mm. Yeah. and It would have been interesting if they would have started writing with Yoko too because like she came up with Imagine, you know. Like, wow, that would have been yeah. crazy if they just formed like a collective, you know, of like, oh, wow. You know what I mean? If you yeah, had you yeah. had her and, and everybody else, even Ringo, I know you're. I, I love Ringo. <laughs> no, you said three of the best are songwriters, man. I gotta, well, I mean, let's just be y'all honest. I heard that, right? Y'all heard that, right? Hey, I love Ringo, <laughs> but like, he's not known for songwriting. Like, people don't call him up for words, they call him up for his drums. It's true. But his songs, they go hard, man. I'm saying they're <laughs> they are memorable. They, they are super are. memorable. They are. But it's in it's, defense of Ringo. It's so funny though, because like I was reading his biography, and like he he tells these stories, like oh I came up with a song, and he like he plays it for them. They're right. like, oh that's great, you rewrote such and such song, and right. he's like, ah oh, man. Right, right, right. So like yeah. No, I know what you mean. I'm, well, I'm just I mean, I'm, like, I'm ribbing you a little. In bit. any other band, right? right? Any other band, like. Yeah, stellar guy. I mean, he has his own band now, but yeah, just anyway. Um, Tali's like the biggest Beatles fan, by the way. She's like an yeah. incredible lyricist too. And, you know, she's put me onto a lot of stuff too because she can hear everything, all the parts. She's really like an orchestrator. 
Oh, so wow. she was like, oh, did you hear what Paul played there on bass? And I'm like, what? what? No. <laughs> so she'll rewind it and be like, oh. And I'm like, oh. Yeah. So she kind of got me into the finer points of like what they all brought to the Beatles. Yeah. Where did you meet? We met. Where did we meet? That's a good question. We officially met in. <laughs> it's not a test, I swear. No, no, there's like, there's overlaps. We officially met in Manhattan. Yeah. She was working for Blue Note Records. Nice. Okay. At, under Bruce Lundvall. Okay. And she helped me get my first album signed so oh. her boyfriend at the time brother was the pianist in my band oh okay yeah i so see how, okay my piano player was like yo like yeah my brother's girl is super cool she wears a blue note you know but it, the funny thing is that we actually went to the same school too but we didn't meet well, that was the the new school, the new right? school yeah 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 did you were you there at the same time or or what was the overlap we were there at the same time but I, I wasn't a student then. I was um, like working there. Oh, in gotcha. The, yeah, in the equipment room. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you got some stories. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't For know sure. what it was, but like the equipment room at my school, I went to a film school, but like, I don't know, man. Those... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can I... I, I took the Spike Lee route, you know? Where it's yeah. Like, he couldn't afford tuition at NYU, so he got a job at the. Yeah. At, and then Jim Jarmusch, he was, you know, met him and. Checking all this stuff out, and that was me. I was checking out amps and, yeah, you know, watching them get stolen <laughs> by friends, and just like, oh, yeah, okay. wow, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah. I just saw um, Keon Harold uh, at playing in West Hollywood. Nice. It um, was last week, right? Recently, yeah. yeah. I feel at was it sun, last week? I don't know. Theater or something like that. Sun Rose. Sun Rose. Yeah. So he played two nights there. I was there for the the album drop performance, and um, it was incredible. Mm. And but he was mentioning uh, the new school and like the people he met there. And I have to ask, like, from your experience, I mean, beyond the education, like the relationships, like, mm. what was your experience with that? The people that you met, you played with, that sort of a thing. It was cool. There was it was. Um layered you know you had the ogs who were the founders and the teachers you know so chico hamilton oh yeah, yeah founded the school um and you know it was funny because a lot of kids didn't know him didn't know who he was he would just be there and just like who's this old guy you know what i mean <laughs> and i'm like that's chico hamilton yeah so I, all pretty much all the drummers and singers end up in like the basic classes because we don't know theory okay so i was in like basic rhythm Oh. Taught by Chico Hamilton. Wow. So I got to meet Chico, which was awesome. And we vibed immediately. Um, he actually had me record on the album with him, which was wow. mind-blowing. Du duo. No, okay. Yeah, duo. I know I'm jumping around, but it was like... No. <laughs> he was like, awesome. hey, come, yeah. come to the house, you know, da, 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 in this penthouse. And they had a whole rehearsal there. And I was like, oh. You know, and he told me, um, I want you to look at these songs. And he didn't tell me the key. Or anything like that just take a look at these songs so i just practiced each song in every key for like a month obsessively wow yeah and i would just walk around the city like singing it and then i would go up a half step wow sing it through because i had no idea and i didn't want to ask like what key or whatever you know because that's you know <laughs> what i mean that's he's a different generation <laughs> oh so my I, gosh i wow. showed up and we had a rehearsal yeah and i didn't know it was a rehearsal but it was like the whole band was there we rehearsed and then he's like, all right, like next week we're recording. I was like, oh, dang. And then he had me record one song with the band and one song duo, Lazy Afternoon. And he was like, oh, I did this with Tony Bennett, you know, in the 50s. And I'm like, oh my God, like, yeah, what? <laughs> no sweat. <laughs> yeah, and we did it. We did the session and it was beautiful. And um, we did we did one take and they said, yeah, do you want to do another one? And Chico said, you know, we could, but Let's go listen to it. And he, as we went to the control room, he said, if we do another take, it might be more perfect, but it'll lose all the emotion. Oh. And I never forgot that. So it was like him. Uh, Junior Mance was a teacher, the great jazz and blues pianist. So, you know, all the other kids would kind of be on their iPhones, like zoned out. Okay. No diss, but I was like paying too much and I'm here with like legends. So I was like, yeah, because his class was just singing blues and that was it he was like the blues with junior mints and you would just wow. show up and sing blues and you would call a song 
And kids didn't understand the concept. They're like, do I need to bring, what do I do? Or, what are you going to teach me? And he's like, you have the chance to play with me. So they never came prepped with any songs. So he would just sit and chill. But I was like, yo, let's do every day of the blues. He'd be like, cool, what key? G, bang. And then I would ask him about like Joe Williams, you know, Dinah Washington, Lena Horn. Yeah. Like Charlie Parker. I, you know, I was like, you know, I wanted to know the yeah, stories that, yeah. that you can't find in a book. Like, did Dinah warm up? Like, did they warm right, up? Did they right. do what was their working? Yeah. I always wanted to figure out like how they did it, not just what they wore and because I know their songs and stuff, but right, it was like, what right. were they like, you know? So that was amazing, you know, and you also had Bernard Purdy there. No. Uh, what? Yeah, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Charles Tolliver. Dang. Wow. Andrew Surreal. I mean, it was really like uh, Reggie Workman, you know, who played with Coltrane. It was really deep, you know. Um, and then you had, you know, I mean, Glasper had just graduated when I got there. Okay. Um, Takuya Kuroda was a senior when I was a freshman, the, the great trumpet player. Um, and yeah, there were a lot of people who were kind of like in and out around that time. Bilal was through there, um, Georgia Ann Muldrow, you know, and then the, uh, just the class before me was like um, Brad Meldow and um, I'm not blanking on the brother who, who played with uh, Ray Hargrove, you know, like okay. just legends, you know, so yeah. you're kind of like, Looking what, around like wow just for some context like what year was this about i don't want to date you but yeah this was 2005 okay when i was there yeah. all right okay as a student and then right, i went i right. went for one year then i couldn't afford to go any longer and they were like tough luck um, and uh so i got a job there and so i extended my my time okay which was awesome i ended up writing my first album there uh, and used all new school people, all students. You wow. Know. And then is that, this is the kind of school you need to audition to, right? You do have to audition. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I think every music school you have to well, <laughs> audition for. Yeah, that yeah. Would be, that would be super easy to get into. Right. Like, I want to go. I yeah. mean, I imagine a, a you know hefty paycheck or something could maybe sway. It's probably true. I'm not going to. It's probably true. I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say that happens, yeah. but... No, I, I auditioned. Um, I was actually in the Thelonious Monk International Vocal Competition prior to that. That was like 2004. Okay. I didn't make the finals. Yeah. Um, but I was in the semifinals. I was like one of 13. And all those singers have gone on to do really cool stuff. Um, shout out Gretchen Parlato, who's a, a LA native. She's, she's kind of my contemporary. Um, and she won that year. So that kind of propelled me into the new school. And they gave me like, oh, awesome. okay. not a full ride, but like half, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, every little bit helps. So. Exactly. I mean, yeah, that's, that sounds like such a, an amazing experience. And for like, as you know, we're, I think when we're younger, we're much more like a sponge and just to like soak all that up. Like, absolutely. Huge, you know? huge. And it was like an interesting moment because it was kind of two camps. It was like, Glasper sort of represented this like new black hip hop R and B right break off. And this was like way before black radio or you know, just right. the trio stuff. Exactly. <laughs> you got it right there. We're playing. Yeah. Um, you know, but he was on Blue Note, so he was kinda like everybody's hero. Like wow. Right. Okay. And then you had Brad Meldow, um, who had also kind of broken off in this like new other style. I don't know what he would call it, you know. So he kinda had these camps of yeah. ideas and styles. And I was sort of like in the middle yeah not really on either one respectful of yeah yeah everybody's thing but trying to find my own my own thing i'm actually writing a book about jazz singing right now so and part of it is oh um, that's great yeah it's it's been you know i mean i don't know i, I hope it'll get done before i die <laughs> yeah but um i got a few hundred pages in and and the outline which is great but the third part of the book as i imagine it um is interviews and i've done like seven of them with people who i consider like the greatest living jazz singers and i don't have any anything prepped i mean i don't do a ton of research about, i mean i know yeah their discographies but not super well i'm not like nerding out like in you know march of 12th and we just talk about like what they're doing right now and like their concept of like jazz and singing and the whole thing and 
every time I do it, they're like, dude, this was the most like. That's so cool. This is like so refreshing. Yeah. Like, cause I get it. It's like, sometimes people want to like, they already know what they want the interview to be like yeah. before they start. And they're just like pushing you into that slaughter, yeah. <laughs> slaughter and, entrance, you know what I mean? And like, uh, I've been going, like, thanks to Shorefire, like, mm. I've been invited to some of these things at the Grammy Museum. Oh, yeah, that's great. And, like, that can be hit and miss, depending that's true. on the moderator. And, like, like, sometimes I notice there's, like, this thing, and I'm, and, you know, they're good questions, but sometimes I feel like they're so rehearsed, mm. or they're almost like, I'm going to put in my opinion, mm. and then I'm going to ask you the question. Right. And it's like... I mean, you wouldn't do that person to person necessarily. Right. I mean, sometimes like I'll ask something just because like I'm curious to what to hear what you have to say, and I might like come back mm. at it. But and like yeah, my notes like I literally just like wrote some things down, and like, you know, <laughs> I didn't even get to all of them. I don't think, but that that was you know oh, wow. that, that was you know not a ton. Yeah, but like because I also just want to let it go where I don't want to mm. steer the ship. Because I feel like if I even when I watched some of my old stuff, like when I did start to steer it, it it all all of a sudden it's, you know, there's almost like attention, like you can feel the yeah, intention behind yeah. it. Yeah, and almost like I'm I'm as opposed to like staying in the moment, I'm like searching for the next question. But mm. it's like if you just listen, you know, it's just like acting. You just have to half of it's just it's just listening, and then you can you can go from there. I mean, we're we're talking about talking. It's so silly, <laughs> you know. But there is an art to it, you know? I mean, there just is. because we throw cameras up, suddenly mm. it's like, oh, we have to do this thing. Yeah. But, no, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. This is feeling great. Okay. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you so much. I, yeah. I, I so appreciate your time and, and sharing your stories and your music and and a little bit of backstory on the new record. It's so, so great. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Anytime. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'm your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you <laughs> on the flip side.